Good everything, Nubians. Yes, what a way to start. Good everything. Uh, I called an audible. Dr. Carr, thank you for sending me that. Uh, I was going to play Justin Pearson's speech before the Tennessee House and uh, his his I have a dream moment. It sounded very, very Martin Luther King-esque. But you sent me this and I said, man, um, as Danny Glover was evoking the memory and the spirit uh, and the... Mm, uh, the soul of Henry McNeil Turner, as he was speaking, saying this would be remembered, it absolutely has not been remembered. Mm. And so I feel like we need to re remember, remember that things happened before we got here. We're not the first, second, or third. We are standing literally on the shoulders and on the graves of people who fought and died. Mm -hmm. For rights, as we battle over reparations, which are old, I, I found it interesting that he said, "We only want that. Just give me, just give me. We'll, we'll let that go." And they didn't let it go, so therefore they must pay because you didn't let it go. You left around, and okay. now we're here. We're gonna take it. But thank you. Good morning to you. Good morning, Nubians. Good morning, everyone in the Good world. Every, I love you. Everyone in the world getting messages from Cape Town, South Africa. Saw Jack Cole jumped in. She actually worked for Trans Africa back in the early aughts. I'd forgotten about that. So she was uh, from all over. People are, yeah, good everything. And thanks to the. Uh, for those on YouTube, he's looking in the uh, chat that we. Oh, have. yeah, I'm looking in the on the app. Y'all ain't got that Nubia app. Y'all better get that Nubia app now. It means you have to be in narrative and then join Nubia, which is separate and, and interlinked, but y'all got to do that. That's right. It's good to see everybody checking in. Yeah, and thanks to the folks at um, Zen Education Project. And teaching for change, that's the website that posted that. That was uh they do collective readings from time to time, and that was from a few years ago when they get together sometimes around the people's history of the United States, uh Howard Zinn's book, but more most importantly from primary documents. Yeah, and that was of course excerpts from Henry McNeil Turner, who was not allowed to take his seat along with the other black elected officials in the Georgia legislature, September the 3rd, 1868. Our friend, our brother, this is actually um, some good stuff. Here's a picture of him around the time. So he, you don't see no teeth, you don't see no, you know. And I was following along, so it was funny because th that was an excerpt. It was an excerpt and it was interesting the choices they made and the choices they didn't make. When they, uh, my favorite line in there, he says, why, sir, this assembly today is discussing and deliberating on a matter upon which angels would tremble to sit in judgment. There is not a cherubim that sits around God's eternal throne today that would not tremble, even were an order issued by the supreme God himself to come down here and sit in judgment on my manhood. <laughs> well, I wish Danny Glover had put that in. God would send an angel down here to pass judgment on my man who would say, what you think? I'm going to stand here and let you buckers pass some judgment on me? God wouldn't send an angel down. They would tremble. they say, I'm not going down here to mess with Henry Turner. Who, who are you? You Christian fascist. <laughs> anyway. No, I mean, that in said, I mean, the part where you talked about fighting with the devil's tools, that mm. the, the, fight the devil, uh, you fight the devil with fire. But then that would be fighting <laughs> with using the devil's own weapons. I was like, oh, like he didn't call you devils. He, you know, um, he said, you know, you have your money and ours. And ours. <laughs> you have your education and ours. You have your land and ours. And I think about, you know, that was 1860 68. something. Yeah, and that, that. Not 1968, not no. 2023. The smoke from the Civil War is still burning. He's standing in Georgia, in the legislature, talking to these white boys. It's like four other black people in there. Can you imagine? I, I also like him calling them the Anglo-Saxon race. No question. I'm I'm sitting here, I'm like, wh why don't we study history so that we don't repeat it? <laughs> so, mm. Call mm. them cowards, Dr. Carr. You are, yeah. the whole race. I was not aware. Cowards. <laughs> cowards. My man yeah. said I was not aware. It was in the character of that race so much cowardice. <laughs> well, I was Justin, the two Justins, and put at least one of them little lines in there. Uh, Mr. Majority Leader of the Tennessee Legislature, uh, Mr. Farmer, 
not 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 to say that young brother Pearson wasn't trying to be reconciled, but who would want to be spoken to like that? No, instead of that, uh, Mr. Mr. Uh, Majority Leader, I was not aware that there was so much cowardice in Sevierville, where you, you represent. Are, you, are, there, are your constituents cowards like you, sir? <laughs> I mean, not, not, don't be begging these people in return. So I'm not begging you for nothing. <laughs> oh, man. What happened to us, Professor Hunter? Uh, we forgot. We and, forgot. you know, it was a slow, it was a slow um, running away. And, you know, listen, trauma is a, is a hell of a thing. And 400 years of indoctr indoctrination is so powerful. Pavlov was able to do it in a few months you know, to animals. Imagine the constant drumbeat over 400 years of being told who you are and who you aren't, stripped of everything, language, culture, name, sense of self, sense of ownership and belonging, and to still have a man like this stand up. But he was born free, as we were yes. born free. So being born free requires something of you. You better show your freedom. You better wear it uh, like it is part of your skin because it is. And freedom does not cower. No. In the face of adversity. So I think about um, we're here today. We're gathered here today on this good Saturday, the day before uh, he supposedly has risen. He is a riz. It's coming. Y'all getting y'all Easter suits? Anyway, so. Um, yeah, get them. I mean, we got them, you know. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I wear Easter every day. Jesus is risen. Uh, those oh, people, wow. you, you better believe it every day. We ain't waiting for no Easter Sunday. But the but the point is, you know, Tennessee did something which a lot of people were shocked. Vice President of the United States, uh, President of the United States, met with all three of them um, yesterday. They they call them the Tennessee Three: uh, Gloria Johnson, Justin Pearson, and Justin Jones. Uh, who uh, two of whom got. Uh, evicted from their seats, uh, while the white lady who said she only was spared because she was white, she said that out her mouth. Yeah. Um, well, she says she thinks she thinks do with the color of her skin, right? Her skin. No question. By one vote, you think they you think they planned that? How they calibrated that? Because the Tennessee supermajority, thanks to gerrymandering in the in the legislature, seventy two to twenty five, that was the vote to put the boy from Nashville out, the young man Justin Jones. Right. Pearson, who was giving it as good as he could give it back to them, he got expelled by a 69 to 26 vote. So actually, several of the other ones didn't who didn't who voted to put Jones out, didn't vote to put Pearson out. And then, of course, uh, the white woman, she was uh, spared by one vote. Of being I, I think they were sending a message. Interesting. So what would be the message between Jones and Pearson, do you think? That that might have been personal. But I think sparing ah. woman, that might have been, I like him. Good point. I don't like him. You know, he, he had the bullhorn, you know, in their minds, people yes. always have these, you know, layers and levels of egregious, you know, the, this was too far, you know, that bullhorn. But I feel like sparing a white woman is like, I'm not voting a white woman out. Right. Because my whiteness trumps everything. Right. A white woman who evoked guns. A white woman who evoked military service, a white woman who, while she's in the Tennessee three, let's be clear, she was leaning hard on that East Tennessee Appalachian adjacent white woman vibe. Very, very true, Professor Hunter. That's absolutely right. When you hear her speech, she, yeah, she in solidarity completely, but I'm in solidarity. Who are you? I am a white woman. I am, I am one of you. <laughs> you know? So yeah, that's interesting. We're, we're in a, where are we right now? I feel like um, a lot of things are exposed. So where our ancestors, you know what? Let me let me back up because I'm I'm about to say something that may not be true. I think our ancestors probably knew more than we do. Oh, of course they did. The treachery and and what what time it is, which is why uh, Henry McNeil Tate could speak so eloquently. And uh, Frederick Douglass, what is the Fourth of July to the Negro, could say that with so much boldness. And Sojourner Truth, ain't I a woman, could say that so magnificently. Um, and the work of Ida B. Wells uh, could just fly in the face of everything that uh, these white women thought they were about, but weren't really, because they didn't want her marching or Nanny Helen Burroughs or anyone else, because it wasn't about our freedom ever. No. And our ancestors knew that, and we forgot. No, that's right. But we're going to have to take it. I always have. I love yeah. the way you. I love the way you 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 described it. When we are born, we are born free, and we're born into human relationships, into these social structures. 
and you know our freedom is constrained by other people it's constrained or promoted by other people and we live in a political universe here in the united states and of course we know we are global you know and this is a global space we're in everyone grapples with questions of i guess for lack of a better term rights but freedom you know being alive those things are coterminous when people constrain other people's freedom you know there are various reasons is it for the collective good in other words you can, i just can't come out here and slap you around or stab you okay we got to have some rules for, or is it for individual benefit or interest you know so you know these are questions we grapple with let me let me ask you a question um april is confederate heritage month and um Mississippi. It's a beautiful thing. And uh, so I posted a video on the YouTube space, yeah. uh, which somebody's like, will you ever go live? I was like, mm, I probably won't where I'm going to engage because there's too many uh, toxic demons and trolls and folk that are unformed, don't read, uh, aren't aren't civilized, weren't raised right. And I'm not engaging because uh, I value my my time and my spirit. So Absolutely. that's it. But I, I'm getting commentary about the heritage of the Confederacy from these uh, unwashed, missing teeth, non-reading, <laughs> ignorant people. And it's like, and they believe it. Like they say with their whole chest, you know, well, you, you fly your African flag, somebody wrote this morning. And I'm like, that you think people who fly African flags or Jamaican flags or Puerto Rican flags are the same as someone flying a Confederate flag is the absolute problem in this country how do we even deal with that other than i block them because i'm like i'm not you don't even deserve to see any of this content period <laughs> you're blocked uh i'm not going back and forth with somebody that damn ignorant but you know this is prevalent though i feel like there's a lot of people who feel quietly i'm not gonna say it out loud but yes confederate the heritage nikki hilly it's our heritage it's the southern heritage that they could absolutely believe that an an outright war waged against these United States by yes. a section of this population. Yes. Flying that flag. Yes. Is heritage. And you lost. Yes. You lost. You're like, you got your ass whipped by people <laughs> who came out of slavery and took their freedom. Yes. It's, yes. It, it's stunning to me, but this is why we're in this space, right? They're protecting something that is, to me, just like ridiculous, but they believe it with their whole hearts. Well, what, what do you think they're protecting? This sense of, I mean, you I don't even understand like how you can, the gaslighting you must do to yourself to reconcile that the Civil War was some somehow this honorable thing. Someone else wrote, well, with all of the people that died, don't they deserve to be honored? I said, do we honor the folk that died on these in, on this soil from Great Britain that fought in the Revolutionary War? Do, is there a monument somewhere? I don't know. Maybe there is a monument to the dead soldiers in the Revolutionary War that were British, and maybe there's a Union Jack somewhere to honor that. Maybe that should be flown uh, right alongside the American flag, because th that's how insane that is to me. But maybe maybe that is the insanity of America. I don't know. Well, not just in America. Nubian Candy is making the point they flew a Confederate flag or Confederate flags in Canada. Remember when the truckers were engaged in there? That is a universal symbol, as we know. Dil Dylan Roof, when he busted up in Mother Emanuel in, in South Carolina, had the old Rhodesian flag and you know and had these other flags the confederate flag is a it's not a it's not a dog whistle it's a symbol when you put that up that means I'm a white nationalist and that's international okay. and hey I think it's a beautiful thing they should I, I don't I, I think uh when I say it's a beautiful thing of course I'm being slightly ironic but only slightly ironic I think they do have a point somebody else said it a minute ago in the, in the chat said uh it is their heritage they choose to be confederates and i think we should take uh the governor of mississippi and his friends at their word i mean we should you know if we had some compassion for him we'd send him a better toupee but you know or he should just you know you know be a man you know if you think you better thank god you didn't run into vernon Dahmer or some of those africans who fought the civil rights movement in mississippi because they'd have snatched that nylon or whatever that dead raccoon whatever it is off your head be a man stand up and he's saying it with his bird chest and I had to respect that. And in his proclamation, he uh, signed it April 31st. Yeah, because like his identity, it's fictional. 
Right. But then all identities are fictional. I mean, I mean, and that too is a signal. You know, it's funny you say that because Turner said this in his speech, another piece that Danny Glover didn't quote. What did he say? He said, personally, I have the highest regard for the gentleman from Floyd, Mr. Scott, one of these white boys is both put him out. He said, but I need scarcely say that I hardly, despite the political sentiments which he despised, the political sentiments which he holds, I would pledge myself to do this. However, you know, this is what uh, then I start say Danny Glover. This is what Harry Manil Turner says to these ignorant whites. You know, and this might be a message to the bad toupee wearing governor of Mississippi who seems to think they're 31 days in April. Henry Turner says, I would pledge myself to do this, however, to take the Holy Bible and read it in as many different languages as he will. If he reads it in English, I will do it. If he reads it in Latin, I will do the same. If in Greek, I will read it in that language too. And if in Hebrew, I will meet him also there. It can scarcely then be upon the plea of ignorance that he would debar me from the exercise of political rights. Now, the thing about that is Henry Turner is not selling wolf tickets because he can read all those languages. The cracker, the, or I'm sorry, let me not call them that. Let me call them the name that they would have, that Henry Turner called them in the 19th century. Also, uh, um, Martin Luther King's great grandfather, Willis Williams, who along with uh, um, Henry Turner helped found the Georgia Equal Rights League. I think the appropriate term that they used at the time was buckra. But at any rate, uh, I'm not sure that buckra could read in Latin or Hebrew or Greek, although Henry Turner could. And he said, now, if you want to read your Bible, since you one of them onward Christian soldier types, the intellectual great, 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 great grandparents of Samuel Alito, Clarence Thomas and others onward Christian soldiers. You know, if you want to read it in English, I'll read it in English. You want to read it in Greek, I'll follow you there. You want to read it in Latin, if you want to read it in, you know, Hebrew, uh, I'll follow you. Oh, so it certainly can't be a question of inner. So Tate Reeves doesn't have to be smart. He's white. Confusing this with a battle to somehow prove yourself uh, worthy to be a full political human being is not the strategy. And, and Turner is disabusing them of the idea. He's basically saying, you ignorant bucker are in here to do one thing and one thing only. Keep black people out of this chamber. So the question we have, which remains to this day, really, which began when we were abducted into this criminal enterprise, very simple. We have a simple question, at least in a political sense. Do non-whites, particularly people of African descent, indigenous people as well, but certainly we talk about African people this morning and, and, and in this space, do, not, do black people have the right to exist in the formal U.S. political universe? That's the question. Do we have the right to exist? Clearly in Tennessee, so y'all don't have the right to exist in the formal political universe. Your rep you don't have any representatives. We will put you out. This is the exercise in power, naked power. So what, bring, bringing back um, Henry McNeil Turner, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, again, man born free. Yes. Um, Son of South Carolina. Shout out to South Carolina. Big, big. In, in South Carolina, right. Yes, His right. grandfather, I think, was a Mandingo warrior. Come or on now. Come on now. See, Turner not going to take no stuff. <laughs> yes. uh, I mean, and, and it, and it must have scared people because his grandfather was set free because they saw the markings on his face and they were like, mm, yeah. this is going to be a problem. This is going to be a problem. Gonna be be a, problem. a problem. Yes. Yeah. We, we don't want you to go. Go on. Go on. We sorry. We, we picked you up. Um, no, no, no. Very seriously, because, you know, there were certain places in Africa. And, you know, we've talked about that many times where they did not send for certain people. They didn't want no more Coromantes in Jamaica. They damn sure didn't want those uh, Bamana in Louisiana and on the West Coast where we're turning them from certain place. Don't bring them Negroes over here. These are the ones that will fight you all the way from capture to right there in the barn. And you can't trust nothing they cook because they will kill you slowly with the glass. Right. <laughs> Manding. Oh, we don't want no Manding. Why did you bring this? Do you see them more? You're free, son. Just go. Just go. <laughs> That's right. Message. Hello, y'all. <laughs> Be a problem. Be a problem. Yeah. So the question, Dr. Carr, is like for you, when you saw Tennessee, you're a son of Tennessee. Mm -hmm. um, when you saw what they did, I was a little surprised. I was like, are they actually going to vote them out for standing with these children who 
their only gripe is not wanting to be killed in school. Like, are y'all literally going to vote them out? They they are going to do that. No. Yep. And then they did just the black people. I was like, wow. I was Beautiful. actually shocked. Beautiful. Was shocked. Beautiful. I like, Wait, I know they're going to actually not, not keep the white beautiful. woman. They kept the white woman. I was like, oh, beautiful. wow. This is interesting. It's Where beautiful. are we right now? So, so what was the juxtaposition? Henry McNeil Turner was ejected from sitting in the state legislature because he was black. What was his crime? What did he do? That's what he said. Yeah, but what, 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 what trumped up charges did they bring against oh, him? Oh, no, no, one no trumped up charges. We just got the numbers. Yeah. Just, oh. Now, now, if we come forward a century, because, you know, uh, like we you, you can think about it, it isn't, you know, that's the Civil War. And, and as you said, Prof, you know, the idea that they were more conscious of the danger than we are certainly isn't debatable because the social structure was different. They had just literally had just come out of the Civil War. Turner himself, veteran. So killing whites for black freedom was something he knew well, having partake, partook of that himself. Um, we think our brother Justin Pearson, as I mentioned yesterday, when uh, you had me and Lamont on talking on 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 on, on your show on right on the radio. You know, West Tennessee. It's interesting when you see the. Uh, let me pull a little note card here to give a visual of. We know. I mean, obviously, y'all know the, the state of Tennessee. It's a, it's a rectangle, right? So, East Tennessee near Virginia, Knoxville, Knox County. That's where Johnson is from. We were laughing about it yesterday because people who didn't see her, you know, now everybody knows she's white. But the assumption was these were three black people because she got about the blackest name in East Tennessee, Gloria Johnson. But she's a white woman. She's in East Tennessee. Then you come to Middle Tennessee. That's where Justin Jones, who is actually from the West Coast, Afro-Filipino brother from Oakland, the Bay Area, who came to Nashville to go to school, Fisk. No doubt one of the reasons why the vice president of the United States came and gave her remarks yesterday evening, which I thought in terms of the time she has been uh, in office at the White House, I think those were the most stirring remarks I've heard her give. I don't know. I mean, you know, uh, Ajwa texted, you know, you know, it was like, yeah, this, this, this the, you know, you see what's happening. I said, yeah, I, said, I thought this was the most, because it wasn't completely scripted particularly the, toward the end of her remarks. It was very clear. I said, okay, well, that's Justin Jones, East uh, Central Tennessee. That, of course, we think of John Lewis, Fisk University, C.T. Vivian, as we've talked about, Diane Nash, who, of course, still walks the earth. These are the Fisk folk, Marion S. Berry. And Marion Berry, however, is from Mississippi. Now you go to the corner, the southwest corner of Tennessee on the Mississippi state line. And, of course, as a, as a child, Marion Berry's mother moved them to Memphis. Marion Berry is a graduate of Lemoyne, Lemoyne College, um, which wasn't mentioned by name, but several representatives who came out of Lemoyne College from Memphis were evoked. And one of them, of course, that Justin Pearson evoked is one of the great uh, black legislators of the Tennessee State Legislature, um, Lois D. Berry. Uh, Lois D. Berry should have been Speaker of the House in Tennessee. This is when the white nationalist party was firmly anchored in the criminal enterprise of the democratic party during the period when lois d berry 70s 80s 90s and she made transition a few years ago but um lois d berry was in the legislature when i was in undergraduate school and we marched on that state capitol many times and i think as i've told y'all before i won't re repeat it today you can go in the archive and look at the conversation we had it may have been around the time when i was at home back in november to a year uh, it'd be two years this this coming November, and we we were protesting the judicial uh, decree that Tennessee State lose its white identity. Of course, they never succeeded at that. They're coming back at it now. These same hillbillies that put out the uh, the Justins on Thursday, uh, but we marched down there many times. I mean, you know, as student body president, I sat actually in the governor's office, Ned Ray McWhorter, who was the governor at the time was responsible along with the legislature for putting millions of dollars into Tennessee state in part because we pressured the, we, we pressured the hell out of him. I'll, I'll edit it, what I would say. But uh, he was a Democrat, but he's a good old boy Democrat. See, those Democrats have now become, many of them, 
uh, Republicans. The White Nationalist Party, of course, is not Democratic or Republican, but White Nationalist. And so it finds itself wherever it needs to go. And we've, we've talked about that plenty of times. But I said I to say that during that period, the Tennessee Congressional Black Caucus, state, not congressional, the Tennessee State Legislative Black Caucus, which had its annual retreats. And, uh, you know, this was the generation that had come out of the so-called civil rights movement. So, you know, they were the direct beneficiaries of the Voting Rights Act of 1965, the Lois D. Berries, the Rufus Joneses, the Harold Love Seniors. Uh, Harold Love Jr. is now in the Tennessee legislature. He's the one who was central in helping commission the report that showed that Tennessee State University has been shorted by at least half a billion dollars over the years from this racist legislature, Democrats and Republicans. And of course, uh, once about a quarter billion was was uh, appropriated by the Tennessee legislature and the Klan adjacent governor of Tennessee, uh, current Governor Lee, for Tennessee State. Uh, this was followed very quickly by accusations of financial impropriety and bad bookkeeping. Mind you, the current president of Tennessee State University, Glenda Baskin Glover, Dr. Glover, um, not only has a PhD, but a JD and is a CPA. Now, as Henry Turner was telling these buckra in the Georgia legislature in 1868, I will match you mine for mine. So clearly this ain't about intelligence. No, this is about the uh, Trump supporting Klan adjacent uh, state comptroller, Jason Mumpower, you know, a real from central casting white nationalist. Uh, you, you remember him from several months ago when they tried to take Mason, Tennessee from the black uh, local government because they're putting a the Nissan plant out there and they don't want no problems as they steal from people. Jason Mumpower, it's the same white boy who has showed up again challenging Tennessee State on its books because pushed through by black representatives in the Tennessee legislature and Harold Love Jr. being one of those representatives, a quarter billion was appropriated to Tennessee State with strict instructions on what it could be used for and the accusations soon came after that. Well, you know, y'all let all these people in and you didn't have room for them. This is bad management. They want to abolish the Board of Trustees for Tennessee State. And we talk about that another time. I'm just giving it as a bit of a flavor to the battles that this generation of state elected officials are waging that they inherited in terms of attitude from the previous generations. And that previous generation that came into elected power in the 1970s came as a direct result of black political participation in the 1960s and 70s as a result of the Voting Rights Act of 65, among other things. And that allows us to evoke another name, another name, not Henry Menil Turner in 1868, but our brother, Julian Bond. Mm. in 1965 and 66 and 67. You see, because this young brother right here, Julian Bond, scion of the Bond family, his father, Horace Mann Bond, had been the president of Lincoln University, then was the dean of education at Clark, well, at Atlanta University, now Clark Atlanta University. Julian Bond went to Morehouse. Julian Bond, one of the leaders of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. This is the cover of uh, a book that was published posthumously of his writings and speeches in 2020 called Race Man. And of course, this is some of the uh, young people in SNCC. You see Bob and Judy Zellner behind him, two white uh, members of SNCC. And, and, and that'll become important in a second. Julian Bond, in fact, let me just uh, read to you from chapter two, Vietnam and the politics of dissent, because Henry Turner was put out and was like, I ain't, y'all ain't gonna pass judgment on my manhood. This is my right. Y'all doing this because I'm black. It's very simple. I didn't realize your race was so cowardly. In 1964, the United States Supreme Court ruled in Reynolds versus Sims that state legislative districts must be relatively equal in population. Now, this is an interesting thing, too. Apportionment in terms of districting requires that if you're going into the federal legislature, the state legislature, you have to have an equal number of people in your district. This is a bit of a challenge because everybody in the, in the district can't vote. You got children, you got people who are not citizens, whatever, but the, but the majority of adults can vote. So for example, in, uh, in Tennessee, you have to understand that it's between like 65, 64, 65, 66,000, maybe as much as 69,000 people in a district. Gerrymandering is the process of carving that up so you can create 
a way to maintain your political party in power. And what the white nationalists have done is gerrymander their way at the state level into power by carving those numbers up in ways that let you snake around. They call it packing and cracking. You pack as many people in your opponent's party, in this case, the Democratic Party, into one thing. So you can't stop them from having some representatives, but you try to minimize the number. And then you crack, meaning what? Distribute the rest of them with some ridiculous lines and whatever, so that you can maintain your power by distributing your opponents in as very a number of districts as possible so that they will always be in the voting minority. That's how they create these super majorities in Mississippi, in, in Alabama, in, in, in Tennessee, and in Wisconsin. And because of the cowardice, the, the, uh, the deep political cowardice of a woman in North Carolina who was elected in a deeply blue district in Raleigh, and then a few months in says, I'm switching to the Republican Party, they now have a super majority in North Carolina. This may be the next. Uh, wait, wait, they did a reverse party of Lincoln. Exactly. Oh, you, no question. <laughs> well, I've been saying this. Come on now. For the last seven years that all we need to do is run somebody in the Republican Party in these primaries, because that farmer guy, I think he got like a thousand votes in the primary, ran unopposed. And I think yes. in the uh, general, he got like 16,000 in a in a district that has a, almost 70,000 people, yes. you don't need a whole lot of votes. All you need is to get somebody to say all of the things, oh, I'm against abortion. What else? CRT. I hate CRT. You can even get a John Brown facing white person yes. to say those things and then get in and go, psych. I said this yesterday. I thought that's what Obama had done, but he didn't. No, well, I, was, I, was, I, I felt like well, I'm waiting for that, though. And You can even get a black person to say, I'm, I, I'm, you know, baby killers and all like strategy, y'all. You're telling me a woman did that in North Carolina said psych switch party. So we got Kirsten Cinema, we got the Joe Mansions of the right. world, dyed in the wool Democrats. <laughs> now everyone is working strategy except for us. We in our emotions. I'm not voting. I'm not. I can't vote Republican. Gotta gotta do it right. What are you doing? I mean, Trisha Cort Cortham is her name, right? I mean, but here's the thing. Thank you know, you. They, they have the meetings before the meetings, and that might be, we might be able to do that once or twice, but you know, they lock that in. Now you got to take a blood okay. Do it concertedly till we can get back power. Right. And then flip the districts back and then go back to normal, have your third parties. We can't even talk third party and new candidates and running against so-and-so until we first understand how to do this at the local level and do it like, <laughs> like, oh my God, the Supreme Court, I'm looking at Mississippi and I'm like, the blackest state in our union, we can't figure out how to play that game? Well, part of it is people not voting. So that would be a strategy that would, could work if people participated. But the voter turnout is so low. I mean, remember Justin Pearson won his election. He had a special election. It was a death or something. A 93-year-old woman uh, died and got 74% of the vote after she died. <laughs> no, we low now. If we, if we ain't nothing else, we loyal. We gonna vote. We gonna, she ain't here no more. I'm still <laughs> saying her name. I'm, I'm still vote. gonna say her name. I'm still gonna vote on the ballot. But when you look at what happened, I mean, you ask yourself, how, you know, what are the numbers? And Jones, I'm sorry, Pearson, Justin Pearson, you know, 1,235 votes. That's what you needed to defeat your uh, primary opponent. And then you run unopposed in the run up and get 400. I'm sorry, what, what was it? 280, no, no, 289 votes was the votes that he uh, got before. I'm looking here. But there are 69,000 people in your district. How could you possibly win an election when your grand total of people who voted for you is 1,200 people? And like 443 or something in the, in, in, the other, in the other primary. So it's like in the general election, nobody's voting. So the strategy that you are describing, uh, Professor Hunter, would be terribly effective if, in fact, it reminds me, of course, in Alabama, that's how Condoleezza Rice ended up Republican. She, she did what a lot of us do. You follow your parents. And she said, my mother and father went down in Birmingham to register to vote. And they said, we ain't registering no Democrats. So they just voted. They just registered as Republicans. Said, no problem, because y'all ain't never going to have enough numbers. It, you're right. Strategy. <laughs> that's what happened. And they figured out two things. First of all, 
We don't need everybody. Who's that? Uh, the moral majority um, guy with the glasses. Ralph, Ralph Reed. Not Ralph Reed. No, 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 no. Oh, gosh. I played. Oh, my goodness. It's right at the tip of my brain. Moral majority. We don't need everyone to vote. In fact, our numbers go up when their numbers go down. Like, it, it is the, their strategy. So we're going to suppress your vote. And instead of, like, being angry, and I'm going to show a picture at the end of this. Uh, first to vote, Smithsonian uh, Magazine. Uh, gift yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna show it right sure now. now. Yeah. I saw that. Isn't that something? I saw it. this lady, Atlanta, black woman, brought her book and her chair five six o'clock in the morning because she gonna vote. Yes. Okay. She gonna be first in line. She, she got to stay out there for four hours till the polls actually open. She gonna be there. And I think about that mentality and why we don't have it. Right. And they suppress it. So if they're suppressing it, they're obviously telling you this is important. So I don't want you to do it. We're going to move your voting places that you used to go into. We're going to purge you. That was Kemp's thing. Let's throw 200,000 people off the voter rolls. You you get there the day. Oh, here's a provisional ballot. You're like, wait, what? How am I not on the... You We, we ain't even seeing all of the moves, right? Nope. nope. Now we know Stacey Abrams and them got out and didn't Tasha and Cliff and them to register as many people as possible to try to offset that. That's but they right. are working day and night to make sure you can't vote. And y'all out here following the Ice Cube and others, like, come on, what are we doing? And it's uh, no shade, but yes, all of the shade, because at the end of the day, this is a power game. It is a if power If you don't have your power tools and voting is one of them, then you are going to lose. I like that, exactly. power tools, power tools. That's a powerful phrase. Yeah, because some tools are power tools. The vote is one. It's not the only thing, but it is, you know, it's so funny. When, when when that picture appeared, it reminded me of that same scene. I saw that scene in real life. I saw that scene before day in the morning in West Philadelphia at what in Charles Drew Lee Lee Middle School, about two blocks from where I lived in Philadelphia for 17 years on the morning of election day 2008. Because I had a cl my class, I think I had a late morning class at that point, 940. And I knew the only way I could the only way I could get to my class would be to get the early train. So I knew that I was probably gonna be late. So because the polls open, I think, at seven. So I went out there anticipating that there were gonna be huge numbers to vote in the first Obama election, in the election of 08. No, yeah, was it 08? It was 08, right. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. And I got there about maybe 4.30. This ain't taking no chances. I was number three. <laughs> Two black women in lawn chairs. Just like that, sitting just like that sister right there. She got a folded chair. These ladies had lawn chairs. It's November in Philly, 2008, in the hood. They sitting there at the door. The door not even open. The door is closed. The poll worker's not there yet. And then I was actually number three. And the brother behind me came. We all talking. The brother walked up. He said, man, I ain't voted for nothing since the first time that Wilson Good ran for mayor in Philadelphia, the first black mayor of Philadelphia. I looked at him. The ladies looked at him. I said, bruh, get in front of me. <laughs> so now it's number four. <laughs> well, my point is, we took that very seriously. Why do you think, you know, well, let me just say one other thing right quick, 30 seconds. The day before, I was in North Philly at a rally. And you remember uh, Lil Wayne had a song, a milli, a milli, a milli, a milli. This was oh, the I big know. hit. I don't, I don't know that song. Some people would know. I mean, the young people might know. Some of you are now. Not, it's not so young. But it was one of them Lil Wayne mixes. They had remixed this song. <laughs> And in North Philly, there were thousands of young people. And instead of a milli, you can imagine, it was like Obama, 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 Obama. They shut down, bro. I tell you that 75% of the young people in the street that day, I'm not talking about 100 or 1,000. I'm talking about, it, it seemed like maybe 10,000 kids. 75% of them were not old enough to vote. They had a rally, then they went out to Canvas. And I saw six, seven, eight-year-olds with signs, Obama, wait, Obama, wait, they knocking on doors. Now that doesn't mean, people say, well, y'all naive, Barack Obama's not, no, it's not about who Barack Obama is, it's about who we are. And we were mobilized, and then, and, 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 but go ahead. And it's Paul Weyrich. 
Um, Paul Rich. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. And before him, it was uh, you know, who's the, the chief strategist for um, you know, the one with the welfare queen and Willie Horton? Like they always know. Oh, we talking about um, uh, Lee Lee Atwater. Lee Atwater. Yeah. You know, they, like there's there's always they have a strategy, it's a southern strategy. What's our strategy? So when I look at this woman. There, there are folk that would call her a sellout or not a sellout. Like she, she's a uh, butter biscuit or like they got all these names for people oh, yeah, yeah. who vote as if like. And so I always ask, I've been asking this because, you know, I said on the radio, if, if Joe Biden is not breathing and he's running against uh, DeSantis or Trump, I'm voting for him. Oh, that's your that's the problem. We just vote. And I'm like, so what are you doing? Please tell me what your strategy. I would love to hear. No strategy. Well, I'm not voting. Okay, so how does that work? No so strategy. They're voting. They're absolute because they understand what the game is. No they problem. are voting for their white nationalists, their racist. They are voting for them, and they're coming out in numbers. And they know how to say that, those things to, to prick up those ears to make sure that they show up. And we are busy bickering over this lady. That's right. And her intentions. And, oh, she's just old. She didn't know any better. No, she knows more than you do. She knows what Henry Tate new Mc mcneil tate she knows some things that you don't know because you're so busy in your emotions about oh they're both the same yeah joe biden might be an open racist but i know one thing <laughs> his policies have provided some of y'all with that child tax credit that you like so much you right, know right. all of the rights the infrastructure bills and, yeah. and health care and all That's of the it. things he don't have to like you I mean, Linda Bates Johnson used the N word, but we got a uh, head start that we still have, and all of those voting rights and all that because you can make somebody do something that's in their interest, whether they like you or not. I mean, hell, some of y'all are married people that don't like you, but it's in your best interest to stay together because it's cheaper to keep her. That's but, right. you know, we, 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 we use strategy in our everyday life, but when it comes to actual rights and freedom, we sit on our hands and then, and then berate one another. That's right. And there are, people, there are people who chiming in in the chat saying they're registered Republican in Virginia following that strategy. Uh, somebody mentioned the fact that, yeah, this isn't just about cognitive. Lil Wayne did indeed. Somebody said that. Neville, I think, said he said F voting and then went to see Obama. Uh, Ice Cube, somebody said it wasn't oh, even Trump. You mean he went to see Trump? He went to see Trump. He went to see Trump. That's right, because that was his buddy. Trump, right, right. The hip hop generation. And to the point on Ice Cube, somebody raised the point about uh, Ice Cube and said, you know, it wasn't Ice Cube so much as it was social media and the technology that weaponized that kind of sincere effort. But again, you know, all of these things, you you raising the issue, Prof. The question we have, I mean, if we, under, if we understand, there are a couple of things. If we understand that the question is, do Black people have a right to exist in the formal U.S. political structure? That is a social structure question. Okay. And... Hmm. I mean, and then and then the second question, which is really the question we have to ask in a governance question is, you know, what are our objectives? What do we want? What right. are our objectives? I, think, I think we should start there. OK, well, let's start there. Then. The first question is it is what we say it is. Right. So I, I feel like, again, we were what Henry said, I'm not begging. It's like we're begging for the lash. No, like no, the no. He said, it's like the slave. It's like we're begging. Please give us rights. Please, please see me. Please. I, I matter. Please. No. Um, power does not ask permission. No question. In, so, fact, in fact, let me let me. This is something else that Danny Glover didn't read. He said, if Congress had simply given me merely sufficient civil and political rights to make me a mere political slave for Democrats or anybody else, Turner says, giving them the opportunity of jumping on my back in order to leap into political power. Henry Turner says, I do not thank Congress for it. Never, so help me God, shall I be a political slave. He says, I am now not, I'm not now speaking for those colored men who sit with me in this house, nor do I say that they endorse my sentiments, but assisting Mr. Lincoln to take me out of servile slavery did not intend to put me and my race into political slavery. If they did, let them take away my ballot. I do not want it and shall not have it. I don't want to be a mere tool of that sort. I have been a slave long enough already. <laughs> this is what he's saying. You know, I'm not going to just do what you say because you want to use me. Like you right. said, we got the power. <laughs> and so we're busy asking well, what they're going to do, what they're going to do. So right. that's your second question, what do we want? What do we want? And until we answer that, 
everything we do after that will be weakness, right? Because now you're, you're just blindly electing people, hoping that they do the right thing by you instead of having an actual agenda and plan. And it should be on, we should be on the same page. Like, yes, exactly. you know, this is the one time we should be on the same page exactly. because other groups, well, they, they got this, this group's got, well, they had an agenda and they asked for something. Exactly. Well, well, here's the thing that we talk about all the time. Who is we? Oh. I mean, there are, there are two, um, and you know what it made me, and you mentioned Stacey Abrams, of course, uh, Howard announced, Howard University announced this week that, uh, that Miss Abrams will be joining will be affiliated with the university. A lot of people, and you know, I, I pause this because a lot of teachers in Nubia and in and, and, and every valence, kindergarten through law, professional schools, whatever. And anybody who is a faculty member at a university, uh, particularly at HBCU, certainly a lot of people I know on the faculty, colleagues of mine at Howard, kind of winced when the administration made the announcement that Stacey Abrams would occupy the Ron Walters chair on race and politics, because to the general public, people think that would mean that, oh, Stacey Abrams is, is, is going to be a faculty member at Howard. No, Stacey Abrams is not going to be a faculty member at Howard. Stacey Abrams is going to be affiliated with Howard. Now, that might mean a couple of times a month or two or three times a semester or however many times they've worked it out, she will fly up to or down to wherever she is, come to Washington, D.C. and give some talks. Uh, put together a few panels. And so, you know, that's a great thing. Everybody should be affiliated. Nikki Giovanni did it at Prairie View. Um, I mean, it's a lot of, you know, it's important to have people affiliated with the university, but she's not a faculty member. She's going to come in and do that. That having been said, the name of the endowed chair uh, that was endowed in part with funds from the donated art of the Walters uh, family, Ron Walters, who is a uh, you know, one of our Jegnas, I knew Ron Walsh as well, good brother, incredible political scientist, his wife, Patricia, uh, who still walks the earth and, and made a donation to Howard of their art collection, which has been valued at about two and a half million dollars. Well, that is part of the foundation for this endowed chair. Well, it's also a question of connecting your name, in this case, Howard, your name, in this case, Stacey Abrams, with a name that symbolizes politics that are gonna make this a very interesting set of conjoint conjoinments. Uh, Ron Walters. Ron Walters is a political scientist. You know, it made me think about it in terms of what, we can, what we're talking about today because Ron Walters was very clear about the fact that a we is not natural. A we among African people is not natural. It's not natural on the continent of Africa where every line of every country is an artificial line imposed by colonialism. Y'all know for the last couple of weeks, I've been on a real Ralph Bunch uh, bender, rereading re a lot of books on Bunch, reading books I hadn't read yet on Bunch, rereading and then reading other things by Bunch that he had written uh, in preparation to talk to uh, Cal, Cal um, Rostalia, who is a professor at UCLA, who's written a book called the most indispensable man on the life of Ralph Bunch. And I actually talked to him yesterday. This is the book, The Absolutely Indispensable Man. It's like a 660 page book. But one of the things Ralph Bunch recognized as a, as like the second highest ranking diplomat at the United Nations, only under the direct, the secretary general himself. And in certain circumstances, whether it be Palestine, whether it be Congo, uh, he found himself as the guy, Ralph Bunch is responsible more than any single other single individual for putting together the UN peacekeeping force. This is not something to celebrate. It's something to note. And the reason I'm bringing it up is this, in this context, what we've seen in Tennessee and what we've seen in the U.S. and, and putting it in a global context. Bunch was, you could call him, a, he's a champion, very proud to be black. At the same time, he was not a Pan-Africanist. He was very critical of Du Bois and, and, and the previous generation. Uh, along with E. Franklin Frazier's and others, because they were saying that, well, you know, it's about class. It's not about race. And you guys are race men, but you're, you're, you you think we need to build coalitions with these poor people, poor whites in the United States, working people all over the the, uh, the world. He kind of flirted with Mar Marxism and communism in the 1930s and 40s, only as he became a technocrat, a diplomat, um, a brilliant thinker, but a pragmatist in his mind. He said, we have to reconcile 
the way we move and what we want with the circumstances we find ourselves in. So, for example, Bunch was saying Africa must be decolonized. There should be no colonies in the world. He was a key proponent of decolonization. At the same time, he had a whiff of civilizationist. He said some of these things in Kenya where he saw, for example, um, um, clitoridectomy where women had their private parts, their certain age and rites of passage clipped and cut, the, cu the cutting uh, of, of the clitoris. He said, there are Kenyans, there are people who get cool you who, who protest this. But the reason some of them embrace it is because they say that the British say they're savages if they do it. So they're using it to build a we. Yomo Kenyatta, who he knew when they were in school together in uh, School of Oriental and African Studies in London. He, he, he was very good friends with Paul and S.E. Robeson, Ralph Bunch and all them. He's saying there are complicated ways uh, in Africa. I see why y'all are embracing this as nationalists, but I'm telling you some things you should bring forward from your culture, other things you need to leave in the past. And Bunch is trying to balance how you do that. He he met Patrice Lumumba. He negotiated with Patrice Lumumba. And at the beginning, he said, this has got an impressive guy. And then over the course of the dissolution of an artificial country called Congo, the secession of the Katanga province, the rise of this fool, Joseph Mobutu, with the help of the damn CIA and the Belgians behind Ralph Bunch's back, Bunch is like, I think Lumumba might be crazy. Now, now, mind you, Lumumba is a hero of Pan-Africanists all over the world to this day. Bunch is on the ground saying it's a lot more complicated than that. I'm raising all this to say this. Even as I watch Justin Jones and Justin Pearson in the well of the Tennessee legislature, we are behind them 150,000 percent. Then I heard Gloria Johnson kind of give a slight whistle to those white nationalists because she is out of those communities. And then, you know, I hear Justin Pearson coming out of Memphis, Bowdoin College graduate, father minister with that kind of ministerial temperament and uh, calling and the catching the voice uh, as we talk. And uh, this is about uh, freedom. Uh, and I'm saying, is that how you talk? And then Justin Jones, of course, you know, with this kind of uh, 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 cadence and, and, and appeal that is clearly generational. I'm, this is not a critique of them, but I'm thinking again in the context of the fact that these things are more complicated. Ralph Bunch was trying to balance idealism and pragmatism, and he trended toward pragmatism, which is why a lot of people critiqued him. James Baldwin, um, certainly Malcolm X, uh, Lorraine Hansberry critiqued him, right? Somebody brought that up, Nubians brought that up the day when I was talking about Ralph Bunch. Now, how does that relate to what we're talking about here? When we say what we want, we have to have a we. Bunch understood in Africa there's no natural we because you draw, and he, he made this critique. He said, y'all drew these artificial lines, you French and you English and the Germans and the Belgians, you drew these artificial lines on the continent of Africa. And then in the process of decolonization, the Africans fighting for self-determination, which he absolutely supported and engendered and tried to help, kept the lines. So Ralph Bunch, in 1960, which he called, among others, the year of Africa, when Nigeria takes her independence, Bunch can look at Nigeria and say, I don't think this is going to work. The Biafra war is predictable. Why? You drew artificial lines, and the people now got to create a country where there was no country. You know, when you read Chinua Achebe's work, uh, there was a country, himself, Ebo. You know, he's saying, look, this, this was not now. Bring that to the settler state called United States. This is the true criminal enterprise. This is a settler state. It's one of everybody in the world living in the United States right now. Ralph Bunch was also somebody who said the Negro must have rights in the United States of America. But he said this is perhaps in some ways even more complicated because those rights are being formed around a we that is not mature. Ralph Bunch said this is going to be a problem in the United States. He's writing this in the 30s. We you know the faculty at Howard University. He said here we got a problem. Here's a problem, and he's not alone with this. E. Franklin Frazier, his kind of comrade on the faculty is doing this. Doxy Wilkerson is doing this. This comrade on the family, Emmett Dorsey. In fact, there's a very good book called Born Along the Color Line by a cat named Miller. Maybe even Miller, his first name. Well, he's talking about these so-called youngsters in the 30s. And they're saying, you see, this society is radically unequal economically. It's inequitable. This is when they're flirting with communism, right? Socialism. They're saying the problem we're going to have is in order to maintain its power, it can create a class of Negroes who are closer 
to the white elite, the white ruling class. And if they can separate them from the rest of black people, then you're going to have a problem. Because you'll have people who look like you who won't necessarily have your interests. So really, to use the parlance we've been using here in class for these years and now, you know, in Nubian and, and, and narrative and then thinking about this in terms of this Africana states framework, if we're talking about a governance conversation, it's complicated because we have to decide who we are and we have to build a we. A we is not natural. For Henry Turner and them, they were all fighting a civil war. So the we is there. They can they can feel the lash. They often use the metaphor of the lash. They came from the lash. Turner, not directly, but he fought a war to, to help free four million who did feel the lash. The farther we get away from the lash, the more complicated the we gets. Because the we can then fracture along class lines. This was Bunch's argument for years. Now, let's think about this. Do non-whites, particularly blacks, have a right to exist in the formal legal U.S. political universe. Henry Turner's point is, I have natural rights, God-given rights, in his way of knowing. And he says, I'm not going to participate in a political process where you decide whether I have rights or not simply based on race. I'm not going to do that. And you can't deny my seat if you claim to have the same way of knowing I do. But we all know that you're a hypocrite and a liar. The great, 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 great grandfathers of the hillbilly Tennessee state legislature, talking about a word that is entirely up to the interpretation of the legislature, decorum. So when this hillbilly from Sevierville, um, farmer, I think it was, the majority leader, when he is lecturing Justin Pearson, you're, you're up there, now you know why you're up there? Now you know why you're up there? Looking like Johnny Paycheck. Do you know why you're up there looking like Merle Haggard, fat Merle Haggard? Do you do you know why you're up there? You're up there because you couldn't behave. You you came in here without permission with his hair slicked back and curled up in the back like uh, peak drug era Willie Nelson. You, 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 you know why you're up there? And then Justin Pearson, rather than saying God would not send an angel down here to pass judgment on my manhood, Justin Pearson said, would anybody want to be talked to like that? Bruh, <laughs> you, ain't, you ain't close enough to the land. You're from Memphis, man. You're from Memphis. Do you understand? You are from the place Marion Barry came out of Memphis. You understand? Out of Wales came out of Memphis out of Holly Springs, Memphis. You're from Memphis, bruh. And I, what I loved about it, well, I, I'll come, I'll come. Well, let me let me just mention this now in the in the in the course of uh, what we're talking about. In the back and forth. When they gave the microphone to Jesse Chisholm, who's 43 years old, also uh, a legislator from Memphis, went to Overton High School. So that's in Nashville, where I'm from. No, Overton was one of our rivals. Jesse Chisholm, who's 43, who went to Morehouse, who stood up with his tie and his suit, not the dashiki Justin Pearson had on or that I would wear if I was in the legislature, the one they wanted to give him grief on because that ain't appropriate attire. Well, maybe somebody could go to the barbershop and get y'all to cut these wild boy uh Garth Brooks haircuts. I mean, maybe I, what is decorum? Decorum is white power. We just what we say it is. But at any rate, uh, Chisholm got a representative. Chisholm said, you know, this isn't about decorum. This is about you trying to exercise power over us. Arbitrary. And, and he said something that made me very, I, I kind of said, this is a, this is an important point. Please hope we let's not miss this. Representative Chisholm said of representative Pearson, he said he moves different than I do. Now, he said that to make a point. When people say, oh, the black community is not a monolith, that's not a revelation. The human community is not a monolith. But what Jesse Chisholm is saying, this ain't about how he dresses. This isn't about his issues. This is about you exercising a naked display of power. In fact, it's not even about us. It's about, as Henry Turner is saying in, in 68, 1868, it's about you. And he says he moves different than I do. But he has a right to move however he wants to move. And then Jesse Chisholm said something out there. And he said, I have to speak to the humanity of everyone in the room. And that's where he ran it off the rails. This is the problem. The problem is that interracial coalitions are, have, been, have proven unsustainable in this settler enterprise because ultimately... As John Henry Clark used to say, blood somehow calls blood and blood always answers. Representative Johnson was not expelled from 
the legend, even as she's standing there with Chisholm, as he's saying, I have to speak to the common humanity. She chose her common humanity, but she chose it through what she only thing she can choose it through, which is who she is. And as she articulated who she was, clearly, either through political calculations or personal relationships, by one vote, she got to stay. Them two black boys got punished. Why? I don't care what you say. And Pearson, talking about God, maybe melted the heart of a couple of white Christian nationalists. And they chose not to vote for expulsion. But either way, what is at the core of this fracturing is this exercise of racial power. They're not going to give up their whiteness, particularly behind the cotton curtain. So when we ask what we want, what are our objectives? Kind of tie a couple of these things together. If, our, if one of our objectives is access and opportunity, you hear that a lot access and opportunity. This is diversity, equity, inclusion people. This is the voting rights. We want access. We just want access and we want opportunity. That's not enough. A bunch of them is like, that's not enough. See, that's the trick. Ron Walters would tell you in uh, in his many writings, I pulled a couple of them, but because Stacey Adams is getting ready to be the Ron Walters chair, and if you're going to have Ron Walters' name, sis, my sister, if you're going to have Ron Walters' name affiliated with your name, then you're going to have to talk about what Ron Walters was talking about or else you shouldn't put his name with your name. This is one of Ron Walters' later books that I've talked about before, White Nationalism, Black Interests, Conservative Public Policy and the Black Community. Ron Walters was very clear that white nationalism was not only on the rise. This is a man who was one of the architects of Jesse Jackson's campaigns. He was also very clear that white nationalism was a force that is irrational, that is driven by race, and that ultimately cannot be resolved by appeals to logic. You understand? He also, in my man Bob uh, Smith's edited collection with Senator Johnson and Robert Newby, Ron Walters had a guiding political philosophy. His guiding political philosophy for his whole life, coming out of Kansas to the time he drew his lab referee in the D.C. area, was... What has this got to do with the liberation of black people? That's my man, Ron Walters. If you're not asking that, I'm not talking about multiracial coalitions. I'm not talking about multi-class coalitions. I'm talking about what does this have to do with the liberation of, of, of black people? Two questions when we ask the question. What are our objectives? If the objective is access and opportunity, Ralph Bunch, E. Franklin Frazier, Wilkerson and them in the 1930s are like, that's not going to be enough. Because what will happen is you will be incorporated into a system just enough to build a little elite class. And that little elite class will then call itself representing you, but what they're doing is preserving their own class interests. As we talked about with, uh, with uh, Randall Robinson last week, when Randall Robinson writes in Quitting America of what he calls Vernon Jordan disease, he said, you get a few people on some corporate boards, you get some people in political office, and the vast majority of people are suffering, and then, but you got your little gated community, and then people outside the gated community, now you get on TV, say you speak for them, but that's, is that going to be enough? No, it's not going to be enough. So when we see these two young brothers, Justin Jones and Justin Pearson, in Tennessee legislature, they're being put out because the white nationalists don't make a class distinction. Well, that's not entirely true. If they buy a Negro, I mean, if they wholly own a Negro in the type of political slavery Henry Turner is talking about, say, for example, if your name is Harlan Crow and you're a billionaire and you give Clarence Thomas and his wife uh, access to uh, lavish, uh, lavish vacations every year where they sit around with the people who are basically... Um, telling him what to do in philosophical terms, because in an un, in something without precedent, we saw this week that Clarence Thomas put out a statement and said, oh, I don't talk about any of the uh, cases at these. Well, come on, man. Nobody cares. You're a, you're a wholly owned subsidiary of white power. When you stood there looking at the ground like the kind of slave minded person that Henry Turner was talking about in 1868, the day George Bush uh, appointed you to the damn Supreme Court or nominated you for the Supreme Court, you see. And when you then, when you thought your uh, nomination was in peril as you sat there and they brought Anita Hill and Stephen Carter and them and my man Charles Ogletree from Harvard brought all these people to testify against you and Joe Biden, the chair of the Judiciary Committee, cut them off, and, you know, after Anita Hill and you stood there as you swelled up with the kind of bile that's in, as your wife sat behind you, uh, decades before she tried to overthrow the United States government, but nonetheless very comfortable when you said this is a high-tech lynching. 
No, a high tech political lynching is what took place in Thursday on Thursday in the state of Tennessee. You, sir, are on a pillow, a, a nice little pillow. They carry you because you do their bidding. So I'm not talking about the Clarence Thompson's of the world, the wholly owned subsidiary of billionaires and others. But what a bunch of them are talking about is if you're an elected official in a position of power that black people voted to put you in and then you don't do the work that those people thought they were voting you into office to do, then your betrayal in some ways is even deeper than this woman from Raleigh, Conley, who switched parties in a, in a deeply blue district in North Carolina. So the first of the two, access and opportunity doesn't get us everywhere we need to get. As bunch of them would say, that's just gonna create the potential for a, a manager class. And many years later, even as Ralph Bunch wins the Nobel Prize in 1954 for his role in trying to manage uh, the affairs of Palestine, the creation of the state of Israel. And by the way, we see that the Israelis did what they do every year, raided the al Aska Mosque, you know, and I mean, it's what they do. It's what they do. Ramadan Mubarak, Happy Easter, the collision, the collision of the Abrahamic faith traditions right there in a land that was not politically figured that configured that way until 1947. Ralph Bunch is at the center of that, doing the best he can. The, the UN proposal, because the British basically gave it over in the mandate to the UN to solve, their thing was it should be a unitary state with, with protected rights for the minority, which would be the Jewish people that came there. Well, they didn't count on the military prowess of the Israelis again repeated later on in the six day war we're not talking here to talk about israel and palestine but we must put it on the table because i'm saying all this to say that in the wake of that bunch gets the 1950 nobel peace prize and becomes arguably the most famous negro in the united states of america and one of the most famous black people in the world he presents at the academy awards and talks about peace he's going all over the world it's really something i mean kyle, kyle, kyle rostalia opens the uh, the book with Fred Astaire introducing Ralph Bunch at the Academy Awards, and he's talking about peace. They love Ralph Bunch. Ralph Bunch sees what's coming, though. By 1954, Brown versus Board of Education is decided in the United States, in part because the world that Ralph Bunch wants to see born, which is a world where nobody is colonized, these people in these former colonies got their own ideas. The following year, 1955, they're going to have a Bandung conference. Two years after that, Ghana takes its independence and Kwame Nkrumah invites a bunch of black people and Ralph Bunch is sitting there with Martin Luther King, Coretta Scott King, and Louis Armstrong, and Lucille Armstrong at Ghana's independence ceremony saying, yeah, Mordecai Johnson, the president of Howard, they all over there. I'm saying that in 1954, Brown versus Board of Education was not a decision based on morals. It was a decision based on foreign policy. The United States knew that it would not suffer if it created a little space for a black elite to emerge, which is why in that same 1957, in a book published originally in France and then in the United States, Ralph Bunch's old, uh, old colleague at Howard, E. Franklin Frazier, takes it up a notch and writes a book called Black Bourgeoisie, where he says, the problem we have now is that this we that has never truly formed, that was held in place in part by Jim Crow, as Jim Crow received, these Negroes might escape from the race based on class. So we look in Tennessee, we're seeing two young representatives out of working class homes and working class formations, but the we that propelled them to power in, a, in elections that virtually nobody voted in, the we that is propelling them to power isn't the we of black voter strength as it was in the 70s when the Lois D. Berries and the Avon Williams, who was a state senator, and to, for my money, still the most fearsome legislator in the history of black Tennessee politics and in, in, in state level, when, when black voters put them in. Well, the Justin Joneses and the Justin Pearsons of the world still have black voters, but given the abysmal voter turnout, they are being propelled and in many ways supported by non-black people. The Tennessee state capitol is a stone's throw from North Nashville. When we would come down and march we will march right down jefferson street with hundreds of students get down there to the same legislative plaza you saw them giving press conferences from thousands of people there protesting like hell raising our voices we would come straight down jefferson street it might take us an hour walking from the dorms at tennessee state 
the auditorium at Tennessee State to the steps of the Tennessee State Legislature. And it only might take an hour because we're walking slow. It's North Nashville, pretty much. Where were the constituents? Where were the black people in North Nashville? Where were the hood people at the protest? Now, what you saw strewn across the floor under the rotunda of the Tennessee State Legislature and Capitol building were young white people. The March for Our Lives contingent, which is multiracial, but let's not be foolish about it. It is predominantly white. Now, on the one hand, that's great. You got engaged young white people, the same ones they're trying to stop from voting now by taking polling places from college. That's great. But the question we have to ask ourselves, where is the we? Where is the governance structure? And a lot of that is because black voters are disaffected. Black voters don't feel like they've been talked to. One of the things I hope that Stacey Abrams, that Ms. Abrams will do in one of the however many lectures and panels she's going to host at Howard in the time that she's occupying this chair name for my man, Ronald W. Walters, one of the things I hope she does is address this question of class. You can't carpet bomb the airways with hip hop ads and drop in, parachute in. And she knows how to do that because the apparatus that they built in Georgia is very powerful at on the ground organizing. It's a multiracial coalition. It's well-resourced. All that's important. But it still wasn't enough to put her in the governor's chair in Georgia. And you got to ask yourself why, because the voter turnout still was not at peak point, which brings me to the second of the two. What do we want? What are our objectives as we think about a we? If the objective is access and opportunity, then we're going to have a lot of Stacey Abrams's, a lot of Kamala Harris's. Looks like we had a lot of a few Lois Deberry's and Avon Williams's. We're going to have some representatives. We're going to have a Barack Obama, even though Ralph Bunch said, I don't think we'll ever have a president of the United States. He died in 1971, long before, but he had laid the foundation in many ways because he's also very close to Martin King. Although he and King fell out over Vietnam. Back on that in a minute, we come to Julian Bond, because that's why they wouldn't let him take his seat in that same Georgia legislature in 1965 or 1966. He ran three times, coming to that in a second. So they're going to be some of those. If, if what we're after is, if what the we we call ourselves after, which is almost like a phenotypic we, you look like me, so we're going to access an opportunity, diversity, equity, inclusion. Well, as bunch of them would say, and so many others, including up through today, so many people thinking about this, working about this, all be working on the ground. They say it doesn't do us much good to have a couple of bourgeois uh, politicians because on the low hanging fruit, like straight racist in the Tennessee legislature, the vice president of the United States comes in. Yes, the Biden Harris administration policy is preferable to the Bush policy. I'm sorry, the Bush. But yeah, it's preferable to the Bush policy, quite frankly, uh, George H.W. and George W. And it is preferable to the Biden, uh, to the uh, Trump policy. It's it's preferable to the white Nationalist Party policy. Now, is it what we want? Well, that depends on the second one, which I'm going to talk about in a second. It is indicative of what Ralph Bunch might say is pragmatism. So, for example, World War II broke out. Just going back to Bunch for a second. When World War II broke out, Bunch is like the threat the existential threat to humanity is Nazism. At the same time, Du Bois and him are like, yeah, Nazis are terrible. And But Japan, I don't know. Maybe we should stay out of this. In fact, I don't even think we should be in the war. Bunch is like, we got to go fight in this war, man, because, you know, by then he had been summoned to the White House by Eleanor Roosevelt because he had reached out to her. He was working on this uh, project with Gunnar Murdoch called An American Dilemma. Social scientist Bunch is writing. He wrote like 3,000 pages of memos about black community, black political leadership, all this stuff. And he said, no, the threat is Nazism. Whatever we're facing here, this is worse if they win. There was real difference of opinion on that. Now, coming back to where I was, when you see the pragmatic question of politics, yes, Harris, Biden, better than Trump. What do you mean better than Trump? Can you spit out one policy? Do you know the policy on paid family leave? Well, that was, a, mm -mm, no, no, no. Do you know that last week, I guess, or two weeks ago, the extension of not having to prove your eligibility for Medicaid ran out, which means it's going to be millions of people thrown off the rolls and you don't have the elected officials now to re-up that or change the law because people are not going out and voting. Uh, 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 that's all right. They're still the same. No, no, stop listening. And again, we're not using uh, O'Shea Jackson as uh, him as a person. We use him as a metaphor. You can't turn on Lenora McKelvey and O'Shea Jackson, also known as Charlemagne the God and Ice Cube, and expect to get a political education 
because we're living with a science technology, as several people have said in the chat, who has disrupted our on the ground capacity to think, to study, to organize, to work collectively. We can't be mad at people who do it. We should join them. Or if we're not going to join them, we need to be in some coalition after we formed ourselves. Those young people on the floor in March for Our Lives are willing to go down there and say, have a die in after they put them out the legislature. What are we willing to do? At least that much? Okay, so we know that. Biden, Harris, elected officials that we want, or at least that we voted for, are better than the alternative. But if we bring the second of our objectives, potential objectives, if what we're after is access and opportunity, that's one thing. But what if we're after equity in distribution? What if we are saying we exercise the vote not as just a right, which, by the way, it doesn't exist in the federal constitution. We'll talk about that in a minute or, or not. We know that. But what if exercising the vote, as you say, Prof, one of these power tools, one of the power tools, what if exercising the vote is about what we can do with the right? And if what we can do with the right is to create safety nets so nobody is starving, everybody got a place to live and some health care, that's a different agenda than access and opportunity. Opportunity means you might starve, but because you didn't work hard enough. No, 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 no. Equity means everybody gets a basic level of human security. Like you, the, you, the UN just released its index last week, the happiest countries. You know, they do that the week before last. And of course, the Scandinavian countries always rank near the top. Uh, maybe it was in yes, last week's time, Sunday Times. It's talking about Norway. And I think it was Norway. I think it was Finland. Finland just joined NATO. I, was, I think it was Norway. And they were saying the Norwegians pushed back, said some of the Norwegians interviewed, say, yeah, you know, we happy, but we ain't that happy. In fact, we're a little nervous now. Why? Because the, the government in Norway is saying that they may scale back some of the social programs they have. Free school, uh, health care. So people like the one couple interviewed, they're both working artists. They can be artists because they don't have to worry about this exorbitant amount of money spent on health care and housing. And, you know, they get you know, this, this, this kind of flat income guaranteed. It's like so they can pursue what they want to do as human beings. They say this might be threatened because in order to do that, you've got to have a form of taxation. You got to have something your country produces that will enable you to work that back into your budget. Uh, there's an article in today's New, uh, New York Times, or maybe it's the Financial Times, where they say that, in fact, let me see if I can find it in three seconds. Yeah, here it is, the Financial Times. Italian birth rate hits lowest level since 1861 as cash incentives fail to deliver. They've been trying to pay women from 50 to 175 euros a month for having children for each newborn child but guess what it ain't working italy's population is cradling what are they worried about you're not gonna have enough adults to pay taxes and they got to take even more resources back part of your happiness is i ate today i have a place to live today if the objective is everybody to have that floor that's a different objective than just inclusion and diversity that's a different objective than access and opportunity and when we see these young people when you see justin uh pearson and justin jones you're looking at people who came out of movements even if they're just rhetorical movements even if it's just social media but the movements say there should be a floor for everybody and the least of these should not sacrifice now, let me tie that from Henry Turner, who is saying that about the formerly enslaved. In that same speech, he said, we didn't, even, we didn't even want to run for office when they had the Constitutional Convention down here in Georgia. The white boys came to us and said, it should be you representing you. So we did it, and now we're here, and you don't want us to be here as an exercise of power? Oh, hell no. We'll overrun this place. Fast forward 100 years to 1965. 1965, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee has been doing stalwart work for five years. We know them best for Mississippi and Freedom Summer in 1964, founded in North Carolina, that same Raleigh where the white girl flipped parties this week at the campus of Shaw University, the great Ella Jo Baker, of course, her alma mater. The Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, um, Chuck McDew, Marion Berry, Ethel Miner, as we talked about a little bit later, uh, an excellent book that has just come out that I would recommend called Stayed on Freedom, The Long History of Black Power Through One Family's Journey. This is the story of Zahara Simmons and Michael Simmons, both of whom Hale and Hardy. I'm going to talk about them in a minute in the context of what we're talking about here. By 1965, 
of course, with that confrontation at Atlantic City, the Democratic Party, Ms. Hamer, Fannie Lou Hamer, L. Joe Baker, of course, Eleanor Holmes Norton is a young uh, uh, lawyer at the time. She still represents the District of Columbia as a non-voting delegate in the United States Congress here in D.C. Uh, they're all in Atlantic City, Kwame Ture, Stokely Carmichael. They push back against Martin Luther King, who is like gives them basically a diversity, equity, and inclusion rationale for why they should take a couple of seats in the Mississippi delegation. They said, no. As Ms. Hamer said, I, we ain't taking no two seats when all of us is tired. This is going to be a community effort. This is going to be, by the way, uh, Cookie Hamer, uh, Pap Hamer, and Fan Lou Hamer's uh, daughter, uh, her, I think uh, Kat Adams, Kathy, I think, is speaking on Ms. Hamer today somewhere in South Carolina. She, she reminds us that in Mississippi, her funeral is today. Uh, she made transition a few days ago, the daughter of, 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 the, ha of the Hamers. But Ms. Hamer is like, I'm representing everybody. That's that second thing. We want not just just when they say justice we mean we want equity in distribution they don't mean everybody has the same thing but there's a floor under everybody well when you see these young people like justin jones and justin pearson they are in that tradition they're in that tradition of when and where i enter as anna julia cooper would say at the turn of the century everybody enters with me there's a politics of race in there there's also a politics of class but we have to be very careful because those who have suffered the most in many places who are voting the least, those who have suffered the most, those who were represented the least in the pictures of the protests that we saw, those who have suffered the most, who don't have the option of going down and protesting for a whole day because they got to go to work and somebody got to keep the kids. And, you know, I got to take my mama to dialysis. With, and, and wait a minute, this bill, how the hell am I going to pay this bill? Those people are the ones ostensibly that the Joan, Justin Joneses and the Justin Pearsons of the world and, quite frankly, the Gloria Johnsons of the world will be representing. The hillbilly horde in Tennessee does not represent them. The hillbillies from Johnsonville, the Johnson City, the hillbillies from Sevierville, the hillbillies represent their corporate owners and the white nationalists who keep returning them to power against their own interests. We can't get to them through an appeal to our common humanity. With all due respect to our friend and brother, Representative Jesse Chisholm, I understand why you got to say that, why you got to say, I need to speak to the common humanity of everyone in the room. I get that, brother, but that ain't going to move the needle. When you mentioned um, Nikki Haley, uh, Prof, when she was governor of South Carolina, and I would, I would, I would say to anybody, if y'all get a chance, go look at the C-SPAN coverage of the all night debate in the South Carolina legislature the year they took that flag off the cap top of the Capitol Rotunda. Shout out to my man, uh, all my people down in South Carolina. Cat Adams, of course, is down there now at Claflin thinking about, you know, uh, Baba Jerome, um, who for a long time has been the, the treasurer of the Association for the Study of Classical African Civilizations. Uh, Baba Bernie, I got, I got the Rites of Passage book too, Bernie. And we'll talk about that Rites of Passage book uh, one week. Uh, they do a lot of incredible work, Baba Derek and them. Um, you know, grappling with that Confederate flag. But when you hear the debates, the white nationalists got the majority in the South Carolina legislature. But what they didn't have was an ability to hide from the power of all the people, including all the people who didn't vote, who were like, you're going to take that damn flag off the rotunda or you're going to need a security guard for the rest of your natural life. See, power tools are not just one tool. The vote not just one. It's just one tool. It's a strategy. If we use it strategically, it's one tool. But it's got to be enhanced by everything else. This is why when the vice president flew down to Fisk and gave those remarks, it's important. Now, I would say it was arranged as quickly as possible. But as we were talking yesterday, Prof, and maybe we missed it because, again, y'all let us know anywhere, global Nubians, whether or not the president of the United States made a statement of any type, a tweet. Lamont made the point. He, it could have been a tweet like, oh, this is a bad day or I don't agree with this. But, you know, you're still chasing them three toothless uh, white nationalist voters. They're not coming to you. You can't appeal to reason. Now, let me tie this yeah, it, well, Kennedy, if Black Twitter has the maroon movement, it's under constant surveillance. And that's the whole the whole point. Um, so B Biden did release a statement. When was it, Prof? Uh, well, this was following the no, he didn't release a statement about their wait, hold on a statement. Last I know week, you ran to go to his ancestral home of Ireland, so I don't know where. 
congressman's man uh he released a statement on assault rifles oh yeah no nah, no nah. uh, no you can't you can't stand up for your party yeah. tennessee democratic party is kind of in disarray there's actually a long article in today's new york times about talking oh. about Carolina. you see it what is that wait wait he decries expulsion all right okay. uh president okay. biden blasted the expulsion of two tennessee lawmakers thursday as shocking and undemocratic. He said uh, last week, three more students and three school officials were gunned down in yet another tragic uh, mass shooting. This was a statement that I, that was on the 6th, but uh, okay. Okay. instead state Republican lawmakers called votes today to expel three Democratic legislators who stood in solidarity with students and families and helped lift their voices uh, today's expulsion of lawmakers who engaged in peaceful protest is shocking, undemocratic, undemocratic and without precedent. Okay, well, good. not without precedent, because we just saw that this happened to Henry. Come in, on, Come in on. Georgia in the 1860s. But anyway, rather than debating the merits of the issues, these Republican lawmakers have chosen to punish, silence and expel duly elected representatives of the people of Tennessee. I have a question for you. Um, can they be reelected? I mean, yeah, I know there's talks about putting them back, back in, uh, but send them what? Do, can they be back. happen again? Like what? what no. is that? No, they can't. Uh, they cannot be tried or expelled for the same or punished for the same offense. So it's double jeopardy is that? It's double jeopardy. Like that? In fact, in fact, as we were watching, thank you, Prof, for that. As we were watching Thursday night. You know, a great deal of that was, and this isn't to denigrate it at all, but to elevate the fact that it was in some ways political theater. In fact, here's the front page of today's New York Times. You see below the fold, above the fold, pair in Tennessee may soon be back. GOP expulsion could have national fallout. Expel for their Republican colleagues for, for an act of protest by the Republican Party's for active protest. Justin Jones and Justin J. Pearson were no longer members of the Tennessee House of Representatives on Friday. They could not advocate for their constituents in Nashville and Memphis, so forth. But instead of sidelining the Democratic lawmakers, the expulsions have sparked outrage and galvanized national support within their party. And the two young black lawmakers are poised to return to the state legislature as soon as next week with a platform and profile far surpassing what they had just days ago. This is where we now tie Henry Turner to Julian Bond. So the answer to the question is yes. Jones is coming back because the vice mayor of Nashville, Jim Schoolman, called for a meeting of the city council, the Metro City Council, 40 people, and the white nationalists in the Tennessee legislature are trying to shrink the, the, the Nashville, Davidson County City Council. Uh, they're a 40 member council now. And under state and local law, they have the authority to appoint an interim replacement and to call a special election. This is a drain on resources, by the way. So all you two hillbillies whose representatives voted to put these boys out, now they're going to have to have another election and it's going to come out the money that came out of your taxes, hillbillies, and some our taxes too, although you haven't expanded Medicaid. So, you know, you might not be too worried about it as you try to figure out, what am I going to do? My leg hurts. They're going to cut it off. But just to have your whiteness. But at any rate, the point is that um, they will call special election, but they also appoint an interim. So Jones will be back because Schoolman, the vice mayor, has already said, you know, we 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 we're gonna put we're gonna send Jones back as the represent, and you can't be tried on the same offense twice. Now, when it comes to Pearson, that might be a little trickier because these same hillbillies, apparently, this has been reported over the last twenty four hours. Uh, some of them have been making threats that if Memphis, which has a similar, uh, I think it's their uh, county board, if they have, if they reappoint Pearson and call a special election and Pearson runs again, they're saying if you put Pearson back in his seat on an interim basis before the special election, we're going to cut money that was earmarked for the FedEx stadium, for, for improvement, city improvements. They threaten now that is illegal but they threatening in it so yeah the answer is they can come right back and probably both will but in pearson's case see because the thing about it is these hillbillies hate nashville they hate memphis you see because these memphis negroes these type of, these type of negroes that if you bring your hillbilly behind down there in south memphis you might you might f around and find out you might f around and find out uh, the bad toupee wearing governor of uh, Mississippi, even though he wishes he weren't in Jackson. That's one of the reasons they want to have this special Gestapo uh, police force. 
in Jackson. They scared of the people who live in Jackson. When perhaps the blackest city in the United States, blackest big city in the United States, 80% black. But guess what? They can't save you. Your little country going to come apart. So, yeah, they can come back. Now, let's tie Turner to Bond and kind of make our way to a close for today. These two brothers now are well known a lot of places, increasingly globally. That is the kind of outside possibility of power. If you can translate notoriety and platform to actual organizing work, which is where the dirty details get in. Justin Jones going to have to do some work now. It's beyond the bullhorn now, bro. Everybody say you got put out. So you got to connect to those generations of organizers and grassroots folk in Nashville who have been doing this for years and connect them with these young people who have now come into the movement in the wake of these mass killings over the arc of the last uh, decade plus. So you got to figure out a way to combine the Marjorie Stoneham Douglas crowd and generation the people who helped organize and put Manuel Frost in the United States federal legislature in the Congress. You got to connect that contingent in Nashville with the people who have been long distance runners in Nashville for a couple of reasons. One that gives you the political power enhanced really by the foundational community power with an agenda, not of access and opportunity, but an agenda of equity and distribution. That's a different movement and you can do it. Justin's. Justin Pearson knows that his daddy administered. I mean, you know, in Memphis, you know the community. You come out of that community. You know, it's not just about getting busts of Nathaniel Bedford Forrest out of the state legislature where the hillbillies wanted to keep their patron saint who founded the Klan in Pulaski, Tennessee in 1866 there. It's about now health care. It's about now they got a super majority, but how long will they have it? You've got to now make a choice of using this moment to enhance your capacity to transform. Now, what can you learn from previous attempts to do this? Well, again, let's let's kind of end uh, in this in 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 our movement with the with the case of Julian Bond. As I said, 1964. The Supreme Court ruled in Reynolds versus Sims that state legislative districts must be relatively equal in population. That's how you send representatives. Everybody got the same general number. The ruling shifted power away from disproportionately represented rural areas. So that's how these Tennessee boys and all these Southerners get this power. You divide your thing up. Now, if it's equal population, then you draw a line and you, you siphon off some voters from, and if you're in Georgia, from Macon. You siphon off some black voters from Atlanta. You siphon off some black voters from Savannah and Albany and you you, you crack them into these slight districts where you can get a numerical majority. Same thing in Tennessee, Knoxville, Nashville, Memphis. Those are the three Chattanooga. Those are the four cities. So you pack because you can't stop them from getting a few reps, but then you crack and kind of draw these little funky ass lines. And now you got a super majority that you hope to. Have. And the Supreme Court is not going to intervene. They call that non-justiciable. They said those are political issues, not racial issues, because now you've got a white nationalist majority on the Supreme Court, including one that looked like you and me, a diversity, equity, inclusion hire named Clarence Thomas. Now, by the way, I, I heard you mention a couple of days ago, Prof, the whole question of this Judge Persigowitz, who just won, Janet Persigowitz, who just won an appointment to the uh, Wisconsin Supreme Court and the Wisconsin legislature is threatening to impeach her before she even takes her seat. By Wisconsin law, they can't do it. They can talk about it, but there has to be an offense. Now, uh, in other words, that law hadn't been used since the 19th century. And even if they try, it wouldn't sustain judicial scrutiny. Because now what they can do is wait for a ruling from the court and claim that it was a partisan ruling and they can try it that way. But even then, I don't think it would win. But the whole point is very important to raise because the reason they can even try to do that is because they flipped the seat again, voter turnout. And now they got a supermajority in Wisconsin for a split second. But Wisconsin may have saved the criminal enterprise called United States to fight another day because if the white nationalists had won, they would have a majority on the Wisconsin Supreme Court. And then when they try to steal the election in 2024, the federal election, the Wisconsin Supreme Court will probably let them do it. But I remember, remember the Gill case, Gill versus Whitmer versus Gill, which made it to the Supreme Court uh, a little while ago, where the Supreme Court said, we're not getting into issues of justice ability when it comes. It's not justiciable. It's not, you don't have standing to bring this case. And in fact, this is not a case that the Supreme Court will rule on in terms of redistricting. Redistricting is a political issue. That's how they get these racist ass super majorities. The court has decided they're not going to get in it. Now, going back to Georgia, we've been here before. When you say you got to have equal population, 
This is before they come up with their algorithms and come up with their nefarious racist schemes, before political disaffection dampens voter turnout, and they can flip these supermajorities that we have today. This is the moment when they haven't come up with all those schemes yet. And so what you have is the ruling shifted power away from the disproportionately represented rural areas. And in Georgia, the reapportionment entailed the creation of new urban districts, one of which was the 136th district in Atlanta, whose population was mostly black. Because the district was new, it had no incumbent. Bond, Julian Bond's friends, including John Lewis and Ivanhoe Donaldson, were well aware of his popularity, appeal, pro-SNCC politics, and they urged him to run. At the time, Julian Bond was director of communications for SNCC. SNCC's headquarters is in D.C. Uh, D.C. SNCC's headquarters is in Atlanta, right there, Auburn Avenue. The political center of the city in many ways. So they say Julian Bond... You know, people like how you look, they like how you talk, you're smart, you know how to write, you are director of communications, you're popular. Why don't you run for this new 136th district to the Georgia State Legislature? And then his friend Ben Brown, who was running for a nearby state house seat, was arguably the most persistent. In his own telling, Bob was reluctant at first and even unsure about which party to represent. But I thought to myself, he's, do he's doing it, Bond later recalled, referring to Brown. He and I are the same age and I have had the same experiences. If he can do it, I can do it. So I did it. To the point you raised earlier, uh, Prof, in terms of political parties, just as, as shells for us to occupy for our political interests. Next line of the preface says, with modest funding from his Republican father, Horace Man Bond was a Republican, but he's a Republican from the 20s and 30s and 40s, different era. Bond ran as a Democrat and enlisted the support of a strong team of SNCC volunteers for a door-to-door -door campaign that tapped into the organization's strength and grassroots organizing. SNCC was about grassroots organizing. This is a word to Justin Jones and Justin Rich, uh, Pearson. At this stage, you got the attention of the world, but this thing is going to flip in about 30 seconds because the NBA playoffs getting ready to start and God only knows who's going to slap who tomorrow, who's going to tweak some bullshit, you know what I'm saying? I see the child out of the bar Bayou Barbie has straightened her hair. The Barbie movie is coming out in a couple of days. You got about... 15 seconds <laughs> to get this momentum into the streets and organize. Uh, now, I ain't got to tell Justin Jones that he went to Fisk. Understand that this is the moment you have to do that. You got to tap into these grassroots organizers and continue this momentum. And you got to go to the people, not just who voted for you, but the vast majority in your district who say vote now and do nothing. What the hell? Who are mad right now? Because whether you vote or not vote, we all clear on this. That hillbilly got to be disciplined. Because you done violated the protocol, not of your funky legislature or your own mind, your own sickness. You have violated the protocol Henry Turner is talking about, the protocol of humanity. And you in the Bible Belt, bro. So get out there and get these people. It's on with Christian soldiers. This is a spiritual war. Go talk to them old black ladies and get their grandkids who might say, I ain't voting for shit. Oh, 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 I'm sorry, Grandma. I'm sorry. I, I know I ain't supposed to cuss. Okay. Yeah, I'll sit here for a minute. Yeah, I saw that. I ain't like it either. What you going to do about it? Okay, this is your moment going on. This is 1964. He says, Julian Bond says, we get a case of Coke, give it to somebody, and they'd invite their neighbors over, and I'd make a speech. Then I'd say, if I do get elected, what is it you want me to do? That's the SNCC Foundation. Ella Baker said a job of organizers to put themselves out of a job. You come into a community, Bob Moses said, you sit there, you're talking with people, and more importantly, you're listening to people. What do you need? What do you need? Okay, how do we get it? What do we want? How do we get it? These are the lines. Not, I'm coming to give you a speech and you're moved, the tear drops down and you vote me back into office. No, that is the objective of access and opportunity. No, the access and opportunity objective is one thing. Equity and distribution, what do you want? I, I, keep, I keep seeing you pulling your side. You okay, ma'am? What's wrong? Your side hurt? Well, that's ain't been a doctor. You, have, you don't have insurance? Let me write that down. We need to get you some insurance. Okay, can you talk to some more of your friends? Because I got to get in office to do that. In fact, we need a lot of people in office. In fact, why don't you come with me? Would you, would you mind? When I get elected, I'm going to have a hearing. I want you to come testify. You ain't got to tell all your business, but I, I think it will be very compelling because I'm moved by the fact you keep moving from side to side. Are you, you okay? This is timely work, yo. This is the kind of work SNCC did. And so in on June 16th, 1965, Bond won 82% of the votes in his district. He and Alice, his wife, left for a Quaker-sponsored meeting tour in England, and upon his return home, Bond faced a crisis that resulted in national attention to his politics and personality. 
at a January 6th, 1966 news conference. SNCC chair at the time, John Lewis, read and distributed a SNCC statement detailing the organization's opposition to U.S. involvement in the Vietnam War. SNCC was out front on Vietnam. Why? Because in 64, as the United States is ramping up, it's the same funky United States federal government that had been messing around in these people trying to fight colonization like the Vietnamese against the French. Since the 40s and 50s, they're trying to fight their way out. In fact, as I talked about last week, Ralph Bunch, while he was trying to negotiate in Congo, the damn CIA in bed with the Belgians going to assassinate that same Patrice Lumumba that Bunch was so impressed with, then said, I think Lumumba might be crazy. I don't know. Uh, that That's whatever, Ralph, because Lumumba is like, I don't need to talk to the Negro. I need a UN peacekeeping force. Ain't you the man? The dog Hammer show said set up the force. Ain't you got a force? And they fight in real war in the UN. You got the Russians in Lumumba's ear. You got the UN in there. And you got these white boys plotting to take him out, and they take him out. Well, in Georgia, in 1966, SNCC, fresh off of Freedom Summer in 64, fresh off of organizing in Lowndes County, Alabama, 65, 66, getting people elected, and I would point you not only to uh, Zahara and Michael Simmons' story, but also to the beautiful story that Gwen Patton, a graduate of Tuskegee University and recent ancestor, wrote called My Race to Freedom, a life in the civil rights movement, Gwen Patton, seriously, because she ends up in Atlanta too. And here's where I'm going to end for today with this and Julian Bond. Bond wins that seat. But then SNCC comes out against Vietnam, in part because when they were in Mississippi in 1964, organizing people, what do you want? How do we get it? You got teenagers who are saying, you know what? I don't want to go to Vietnam. What? Yeah, my people in the military, they talk about war. We need to come out against this war. And it is the people of Mississippi, particularly these young people who tell SNCC, we got to come out against the war. Bond gets elected, SNCC comes out against the war, and the hillbilly horde, paper tigers, studio gangsters, deny Julian Bond his seat. Because Julian Bond comes out against the Vietnam War. He's a member of SNCC and a member of the Georgia legislature, but on January 10th, 1860, uh, 1966, not 1868, 100 years later almost, the House clerk asked Bond to stand aside in light of the, all the petitions while other House members were sworn into office as his colleagues, including those on either side of him, stood and swore their allegiance to the Georgia Constitution and the U.S. Constitution. Bond remained in his chair. After the swearing-in ceremony, he then walked to a pool of reporters and offered them the statement that appears below. He gives a speech. I got to speak to my constituents. I am against the war. I probably would, I would not fight in the war. And so they denied Julian Bond his seat in the Georgia legislature. Then they called. Then he goes on Meet the Press. So this is the equivalent of what we're talking about now with social media. And he says, why? And then watch this. Two days before the taping of Meet the Press, a federal district court held a hearing on the suit that Bond had filed against his most outspoken critic, House member Sloppy Ford. Sloppy Ford. Sloppy Ford, the father of every hillbilly in the Tennessee state legislature. Sloppy Ford in the, the damn Georgia legislature in 1966. These are the white nasties. We're going to keep these N-words out. And you ain't patriotic. You, sir, are, uh, uh, you, you're a communist. You, you're against the Vietnam War. You ain't going to the war. And as Gwen Patton writes in her book, and as Michael and Zahara Simmons relate, when Julian Bond is denied his seat, they form a committee to reelect Julian Bond. Uh, Jim Foreman writes about it in his book, too, and, talk, and talked about that before he made transition, of course, to making a black revolutionaries. They come to Atlanta, these young people, they're going to put Julian Bond back in that office. And what happens in the months in the wake of that? Sammy Youngie Jr., a veteran, Navy veteran, is killed in Tuskegee. Gwen Patton writes so movingly about that. She was student by president of Tuskegee at the time. Remember I talked about Brother Jones's book, The Tuskegee Student Movement. They are incensed. These hillbillies who wouldn't throw rice at a wedding, wouldn't bust a grape in a fruit salad. Somehow the poor got to go die. You sitting up here talking about patriotism, like the vice president said at Fisk uh, last night with the lapel pin on, or oh, she was hot. I was like, you should talk like this more, sis. 
I know the mummy not going to talk like this, but you should talk like this because if they're trying to position you to run or not run or whatever they're trying to do, your move is toward us. Your move is not toward them. This is not a diversity, equity, inclusion anymore. This is not about access and opportunity anymore. This is about equity or it should be or, or your country going to fall apart. You know, either way, we're going to suffer. So, you know, you want to join us or not. Now, the point is that Sammy Youngie is killed. And then Vernon Dahmer, who got four sons in Vietnam, is killed. This is the legendary Vernon Dahmer in Mississippi. Vietnam's a serious issue. SNCC has come out against it. Bond comes out, joins them, of course, because he's in SNCC. He's also in the state legislature. They put him out. And then the court, federal court, Albert Tuttle, you've heard me mention Judge Tuttle before. is a great book on him. Griffith Bell and Lewis Morgan ruled two to one that Bond's support of the SNCC statement provided rational grounds for the House's conclusion that he could not faithfully swear to uphold the state and federal constitutions. These judges, two to one, say, yeah, because he won't, he, we can't trust him to uphold the state constitution and the federal constitution. Again, that question, do black people have a right to exist in the formal U.S. political universe? Yeah, freedom of speech, watch what you say, as Ice-T said. Goes on. Bond appealed to the ruling to the United States Supreme Court, and on December 5th, 1966, the court unanimously ruled that Georgia had violated Bond's right to speech. So what happens? In the meantime, Bond had stayed in the race for the open seat in his district. He won the special election that was called shortly after the House had denied him his seat. And he also won the regular election after that. So let's cut it today. Justin Jones, Justin Pearson, if they're sent back by the councils of Memphis and, and Nashville, respectively, they still got to have an election. Bond went through that, the version of that in Georgia, won that appointment, and then won the special election to get his seat again. Finally, on January 9th, 1967, Bond took the oath of office and was seated in the House as the elected member of the 136th District. The House paid him $2,000 in back pay for service wrongfully denied. But here's where I want to go with that. Not that he was put out, although that's the, 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 the context for bringing this up. Those young people who moved to Atlanta like Gwen Patton, like Zahara and Mike Simmons, that came to Atlanta to work on that campaign, to reelect Julian Bond, that became the Atlanta project of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. And they said, we must turn inward. We need black power. This is when Mukasa Ricks, who's still around in Atlanta, still going strong, involved in this as well. This is when you see the SNCC split. The national office, there's tensions there. Ruby Doris Robinson, uh, Ruby Doris Smith Robinson, um, you know, she's she's directing SNCC at the time. You know, she has sent she has sympathy with the black national's position. We don't need white people in SNCC. They ain't but about eight of them in the national office and anyway, but she's still got to try to manage the office. There's a there's a concern about pragmatic, there's a pragmatic concern. John Lewis and them are like, look, y'all. If we go with the straight black, no white people involved, our funding is going to dry up. It isn't that we don't agree with y'all. Hell, you know, John Lewis met Malcolm X in East Africa. Again, the pragmatism. Here's the tension again. The Ralph Bunch uh, dilemma again. And it's Snick and Sammy. But eventually, you know, and of course, uh, John Lewis was good friends with Jim Clyburn, of course. And remember Clyburn talking about pragmatism, why he endorses Joe Biden. Well, it looked like his number may be up because in South Carolina, Democrats do battle over our way forward. Clyburn is trying to uh, pick the next state leader. That's his pick right here, this sister right here. But this sister and this brother right here running against her and they like, time out. Sorry, thanks for your service. We're very happy. The Orangeburg massacre is terrible. South Carolina State Bulldog. We with you, Baba. We with you. And now it's our generation. So the generational stress that was born in the 60s and 70s as these black people are fighting these issues, we saw it play out in SNCC after Bond is expelled and the Atlanta Project is born out of the committee to reelect Julian Bond and the Atlanta Project says black self-determination has to be at the key of all, is key of all our politics, all of our politics. We got to have this black organization, got to do this pan-African internationalist move and ultimately the decision to have, you know, Bob and Julie Zellner and all them. Remember, I mentioned the Zellners earlier on the cover of this book. They put out a snick. You see, now, of course, they stay all comrades for the rest of their lives. Some of them still around, right? And uh, I, I know a few, uh, quite a few of them, in fact. And it's this is the multiracial coalition you need. But today in Tennessee, you got some young whites. You got some young non-whites. But the vast majority of people haven't been pulled into the conflict. 
at a moment when everybody at least knows the faces of the so-called Tennessee three. But let's say the Tennessee two plus one because Gloria Johnson didn't lose her seat. And so I, I'll just uh, mention uh, just a, a couple of other things. As I said, if we're asking what we want, we have to build a we to decide that. The way you do that is human contact through organizing, through struggle. It's easy for the white nationalists at this point. It's easy for them because, again, if we ask the question, do black people, do non-whites, but do black people have a right to exist in the formal U.S. political universe at the federal level? That's a question batted between uh, federal interests, foreign policy interests, and domestic interests, which are often, you know, informed by lobbyists. By the way, footnote, did y'all see? Uh, it was in the Financial Times this past week. The hedge funds made collectively over $7 billion with the failures of SVB and the other banks that failed. Why? Because they borrowed stock from those banks and then sold the stock back for less than they paid for it <laughs> when they borrowed it. They made $7 billion because they knew the bailout was coming. Come on, y'all. We got to pay attention. But at any rate, so you got federal interest at the federal level informed by all kind of actors. You got legislative interests. You got judiciary and judicial interests. And we talk about rights in this country. This is Jamal Nelson's work. When you start talking about rights, we increasingly look to the courts. Somebody brought that up at the expulsion hearing on Thursday night. One of the legislators, in fact, this is a white dude who represents part of Nashville, went to Belmont undergrad, right down the street from my house. He said, you are depriving these legislators of a right of their property. The property is their elected position, but I'm sure there's a due process, procedural due process argument that would nullify that. But it's very interesting because ultimately the point I'm making is that we typically now look to the courts in this country to protect our rights. But what we saw on display on Thursday was the legislature got to say what the rights are. They got to define decorum. Now, sure, you can go to court, but they're going to defer to the legislature. This is the federalist system. So at the federal level, you see that? This is the whole thing about the Supreme Court. Said, well, what voting doesn't matter. The president picks the damn judges and the Congress or the Senate approves them. You got to be careful about Clarence Thomas has been running around here getting millions of dollars of free stuff. And then he put out a statement saying, well, we changed the rules. So from now on, I'll report it. From now on, who you 150 billion years old? It's that that cat is out the bag, bro. And now Dick Durbin, the chair of the Judiciary Committee and Senate is saying, we're going to have some hearings about this. We may have to do something about this. Impeach his ass. You could do it. You could do it. Put your back into it. Since we've been beating up Ice Cube, I figured I would quote an Ice Cube line. At the state level, you have the same thing. You have the executive, you have the judiciary, and you have the legislative. The governor, the white nationalist governor of Tennessee, Bill Lee, who was threatening Tennessee State, now so he ain't said too much because the legislature doing the dirty work. Will it find its way into the courts? Probably not, but they got those courts packed. Now, at the local level, you've got executive and legislative. You have judiciary too, but it doesn't function in the same way. So when we start talking about political power in Jackson, Mississippi, in Atlanta, Georgia, when we talk about political power in Charlotte, North Carolina, or New Orleans, we talk about political power in places like Philadelphia or Newark or New York City or Detroit or California. It isn't just the color of the skin. It is the politics. And political power, Jackson is a great example of this, isn't enough, although you it is, it is necessary but not sufficient, meaning... We know it's not sufficient, but it's necessary. When you've got Chokwe in the mayor's office, that means that your organizing has an ally in there. So what did the white nationalists do at the state level? They try to take autonomy to the state level. This is that punk governor of Mississippi and his supermajority white nationalist legislator. And at that point, you have to get involved. You don't just have to. In fact, registering to vote is important. Because you also draw from the voter rolls for your jury trial. When they, when, when they, when that white boy killed Sammy Younger in Tuskegee, they were going to have the trial in that county. They moved it to Opelika, which is like five seconds from when my mother was born on the floor of the house that my father, my grandfather built with his hands there in Russell County. They moved it over there because the Voting uh, Rights Act, because of the Voting Rights Act, there were so many Negroes registered to vote. In Tus where Tuskegee is, that the jury was going to be majority black. They moved it to Opelika to get an all-white jury, and they let that white boy go. So you rested to vote in part to be on the roll, and when it's time to vote, you vote. And if you don't like the candidate, run. Julian Bond said he could do it. I could do it. 
In fact, that's how you get Justin Jones and Justin Pearson, two young brothers. And so finally, on this Easter weekend, we have to think about, we ask the question, do we have a right to exist as political actors in this U.S. legal universe? We have to think of the covenant of the United States. The United States has a covenant on this Easter weekend. In fact, uh, maybe about 10 years ago, I gave a talk at the National Archives. Um, I forget, it was Black History Month or something like that. And the name of my talk was Abraham Lincoln, American Jesus. <laughs> they were like, what? Is that your title? Yeah, yeah. So, of course, people came to see what I was going to say. No problem. Abraham Lincoln, American Jesus. Let's look at the United States. This fine, ain't no state religion, but we know y'all white Christians, so. To be Jesus, you got to have a father. And you're going to talk about father and the son in the Christian theology, you got to have a Holy Ghost, right? Please forgive me all of the ministers in here right now, beginning with Jeremiah, right? Who I got a feeling has preached this much better than I could. In fact, I would love to hear what you think about this. I said, in America, this secular place, you know, Pauline Kale, American scripture, you know, the Constitution being the Bible or so forth. You know, George Washington is the father. He is your deputy. He's your father. George Washington's God. And so are his friends. So when Clarence Thomas, eyes bulging, neck bulging, uh, which, you know, his wife, since she's good at beating up the government, her hands should be strong enough to give him a massage every once in a while on one of them half million dollar trips they own with their holy own master. But at any rate, uh, you know, it's kind of relieved some of that pressure, that high blood pressure that has turned his hair snow white and perhaps shortened the days that he would be on the Supreme Court. But Clarence Thomas, you know, he talks about our founding fathers as if he wouldn't have been out with his shirt off in the damn fields in the, in the Sea Islands. But anyway... Uh, yeah, George Washington's God. His friends are God. Madison, Lincoln, Jefferson, and you know, some confused Negroes put some makeup on and they become brown faced minstrels in plays like Hamilton, destroying our movement in memory. But they're the father, George Washington, the father. If George Washington is the father, isn't Lincoln the son on this Easter weekend? This Easter weekend, this is the passion of Abraham Lincoln weekend, right? The Civil War ended April the 9th, formally 19. 1865, tomorrow in the U.S. Appomattox Courthouse, Virginia, Lee surrenders to Grant. April 14th, John Wilkes Booth, who would have participated in the January 6th insurrection, who probably, if he was in the legislature, would have voted against these brothers. John Wilkes Booth, Skyon, popular actor of the day from an actor family, like the Sheen, like Charlie Sheen and Martin Sheen, and that's John Wilkes Booth, his daddy and brother, right? John Booth, Shoots Lincoln, puts a bullet in his brain down the street here or off of 10th Street at uh at, at Forest Theater, F Street. And they'll probably reenact it tomorrow. I might sneak down there on the 14th to see because I went down there to watch it before. I'm like, man, they be reenacting the whole thing. The bell hits, you see them take Lincoln across the street to the house, and he dies the next day. Lincoln suffers and he dies the 14th of April, 19, 1865. And he in transitioning, as it was it Seward that said, now he belongs to the ages, he's resurrected. Lincoln comes to fulfill the law. Like Jesus came to fulfill the prophet, prophet of the Old Testament, Lincoln comes to fulfill the promise of the Constitution. Except it wasn't Lincoln, it was us. And it was the radical Republicans, 13th, 14th, 15th Amendment, Charles Sumner and all them boys, right? They did that. Now, here we go. Well then, if you got a father, you got a son, all this is April. Professor Hunter, if you got a father, George Washington. If you got a son who went through the passion of his of his elevation, his death and resurrection, the, having survived the trial of the Civil War in April, who then would be the Holy Ghost, also with an April connection? Oh. Oh, uh, oh, uh, J J J JFK, maybe? I don't know. Uh, let's think about it. Who was killed on the 4th of April? Or the old Martin Luther King Jr. Exactly. So in my talk. I was thinking someone that got assassinated for exactly. sure. Exactly. No okay. question. You had all of them. Okay. Okay. Here's the yeah. thing. This is why I said this is the artificiality of this criminal enterprise we call United States. Jesus. You have exactly you have created a theocracy masquerading as a democracy. Because when these white boys, you done violated the code. Why? Their God is whiteness. They had a white God, whether it be the Klan or the Nazis 
or the neo confederates or the not even say neo in mississippi the confederates <laughs> and I mean, when they say this is about heritage no it's your theology it's your way of knowing whiteness is your way of knowing and when you put a criminal enterprise like that together i said the reason i'm gonna call these threes because i want you to look at how absurd this is george washington who would have had martin luther king's ancestors in the field abraham lincoln who was ambivalent just wanted to win the war but in his death you've created him as a secular saint and then the holy ghost steps onto the mall in front of the sun and says, I have a dream. I have a dream. What does the Holy Ghost do? The imperishability of truth. Truth forever on the scaffold, wrong forever on the throne, but that scaffold sways the future and beyond the dim unknown standeth God behind the heavens keeping watch upon his own. I have a dream today. That's not Martin Luther King, that's John Dunn. And it's not John Dunn and being quoted by King because he was reading Dunn. It was Benjamin Elijah Mays, the American Negro having faith in something that transcends this criminal enterprise, whether it be Henry Turner telling them God wouldn't send an angel down here to pass judge. There's something bigger than you, whether it be Abe Lincoln saying, we're gonna pay for this in blood in the second inauguration speech. And he was right, beginning with his own, whether it's Martin King that says, be true to what you said on paper. Why? Because the constitution is just a stopgap. The big thing is the relationship of humanity to the moral universe. And the mark is long, but it bends toward justice. When we saw young Justin Pearson trying out his preacher legs on the floor of the Tennessee legislature on Thursday, he was evoking something beyond the rules of the Tennessee legislature, beyond white nationalism. We heard Justin Jones, he was trying to do the same thing. We heard Gloria Johnson, she trying to do the same thing, but the test of it will be not only whether we're registered to vote and put people in, not only whether we'll organize, but whether we will have the momentum of memory to understand that the only thing that has kept this criminal enterprise out of the abyss besides the naked power of violence, which is no longer what it used to be in a world where there's a multipolar world, where they say something to the Chinese and the Chinese government tweets back, I can't breathe. <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> where the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee that came to get Julian Bond reelected then decided to turn their focus inward and go international. And by the way, near his death, Ralph Bunch says, perhaps there's nothing more American than the Black Panther Party. Bunch even sees, because he's an internationalist, even as he is also a patriot, the contradictions are there, the pragmatism. We have to understand that our appeal, our we has to be grounded in a commitment to principles that transcend anything written on paper in this place. And if we're gonna win this, we have to stop confining our efforts to the letter of documents that they don't even believe themselves. That's a good lesson to learn on this on this Easter, Easter weekend. So mm -hmm. we just stop with that. <laughs> no, I'm just saying. I mean, maybe they don't deserve the Holy Ghost. They don't deserve Martin Luther King. They can't catch the spirit. I don't know. <laughs> I, I cannot wait for Dr. Daniel Black to join us. Yes. There's so many people I know that are triggered right now. Like you, you are blaspheming the name of Jesus this Holy Weekend. No, I would. I would never do that. Look, no, I, I know. I know. But you know, it's it's like we 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 run into looking to be offended so that we can yes, have okay. some emotion. No question. My thing is, you should be uh, talking about that. G, look, if you are a Christian, look, I'm not going to steal from Jeremiah Wright or any of the other ministers, but the guy never had a house. He had to rely on the people, rode a donkey into town. His mans sold him out, counterintelligence program, put him on trial, and the people said, give us the criminal. Give us Barabbas. We ain't want this cat. They crucified him and then persecuted his followers, and then the same place that killed him adopted it as the state religion and kept the persecution going until what is this april the 8th <laughs> so if you say you're a christian come for me let's dance let's dance <laughs> let's yes. dance, let's dance. Yes. <laughs> no, no question. Yeah, let me tell you um 161 episodes and counting this is uh the space that i never knew i needed in my mm -hmm. life and i'm so grateful um to everyone that is part of this journey. Um, I'm in the chat. Uh, there's a lot of questions. You can oh, yeah, uh, yeah. pretty much join. No, well, office hours is for that, right? Well, that's so right. That's right. Know. Monday night. So, so show, show up on office hours, ask oh, your yeah. questions, new people, new faces. Please don't be scared. Come no, on in and, and talk to Dr. Carr, because that's why we have 
these spaces. And uh, tomorrow, of course, Dr. Senyata is going to be in community with yes. folk. And we got that Dr. Mario Beatty, uh, of course, Lindsay with the yoga and right. more, mm-hmm. more people are coming uh, to That's teach right. uh, Dr. Tasha every now and then with the language. And yes. I'm, just, I'm just grateful. I'm just people grateful. Coming. People coming. And oh, yeah, you're right. Let me say that. The gendered, that's Henry Menil Turner's language. And in fact, Henry Turner in 1898 wrote a piece called God is a Negro. He said, God doesn't have a gender. God is not human. God is the color of the air, the grass, the things you can see, you can't see. But as long as you white boys say God is white, I'm going to say God is a Negro. Let me just say that I'm saying he because he said he, but we don't put a gender on the creator. No question. Okay. But if you formed out of dirt, I don't know what color dirt is. Anyway, <laughs> you <laughs> saying I just oh, you know logic, me. logic. <laughs> All right, let's let's end with this picture and, and thank everyone. Happy Easter, those of you going to church tomorrow. You know, praise the Lord. You know, do all of that. Uh, and, uh, no question. Easter egg hunts in the in the jelly bean. you have doing with the peeps. God bless you. Uh, and, God bless. and I want to end with this image because I feel like this is uh, everything. Yes. The the being in line, the waiting, but she has a book in her hand. Yes. She's reading. So it's not just, I'm not just going to come and show up. I'm going to get knowledge. I'm going to educate myself. I'm going to learn. I'm going to read and I'm going to sit. I'm going to be patient because my turn is here. Yes. My turn is here. I will cast my vote because I have power. Because I have, if that was my mama, that would probably be the Bible right there. Yes, I love it. I love it. Love you, Dr. Carr. Love you too, Professor Hunter. Love everybody. See you all Monday night. Yes. Bye.